Well, good evening, everyone. We would like to welcome you to the newly renovated council chambers. We're glad to have you. It looks like we've missed one another. We have a full house tonight, but uh, I'd like to call the Fayetteville City Council meeting to order. At this time, we will move to the invocation. And we have uh, Father Alex. Take a stab at it. Uh, I didn't want to mess it up, sir. Papa okay. Jagos? Yes, sir. Very good. Yes, uh, sir. All right. Well, welcome, sir. Thank uh, you at this much. time, if we could uh, pray, and then after that, if we could go into the Pledge of Allegiance. Father? I want to firstly thank you for the opportunity because yeah. um, you are always so kind and gracious to our community. You remind me of the passage in Matthew that says, we are all brothers and sisters. And I want to thank him. Kathy, of course, called me this morning and asked me if I was doing anything tonight. And I said, yes. I said, I have plans for this evening. And I said, why? And she said, oh, um, could you come and do the invocation? And I said, the plans can wait. Well, thank you. And can can we stand to... before you pray, Father? Yes, please. All right. Thank you. My beloved brothers and sisters, let us pray t on the 25th of March, the day of Annunciation, Greek Independence Day, we sing hymns of victory and, and thanksgiving, remembering our brothers and sisters, a fellow Orthodox struggling in the Ukraine at this very hour, in this very day, who are under a brutal and inhuman attack by their neighbors, even their fellow Orthodox Christians. We remember that last year, as we celebrated the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution, that in those early days of the struggle for independence, many Greeks came home from abroad, from Odessa and Kiev and other regions of the Slavic world where they fought for the freedom of Greece. And today we hold dear in our hearts not only our Ukrainian brethren, but our fellow Greeks who are still in peril as we speak this evening. The day of Annunciation, the day of commencement of liberation, is a day that we pray, Heavenly Father, the greatest prayer of peace that Almighty God and Creator, you are the Father of all people on the earth. Guide all the nations and their leaders in the ways of justice and peace. Bless our city of Fayetteville. Bless these, your officials, Heavenly Father, and continue to give them prudence and the way, Heavenly Father, of never, ever leaving the paths that bring peace in people's lives. Give to them, Heavenly Father, and to all of us health, life, peace, and salvation. To your honor and praise, we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, to and to the republic, republic for which, which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. <laughs> Thank you, Father. If you can tell us a little bit about Thank yourself you. and your, your ministry. Well, it's been 13 years that I've been here in Fable, and it's gone by very quickly. And um, we enjoy, still, we've redone our Hellenic Center in anticipation of another festival and another spaghetti dinner. And I've enjoyed seeing Kathy in her role on the city council. And she has instilled service into her oldest son, Jake, who's now on our parish council. And he is the youngest member of the parish council. And hopefully he's going to uh, look forward to following in his mom's footsteps one day. I'm encouraging him to serve and to always remind us how service is so vital to us. And I want to thank the council very much because every time I have an issue with the church or with our neighborhood or with anything, the council is always willing to listen and to help and that we want to see you as part of our community, not just to eat spaghetti and to have fun at the festival, but to be such a part of our community. And it's an honor to be able to have all of you as our friends of our church as well. Thank you, Honor. Thank you, sir. And thank you for moving your plans around to join us this evening. Uh, Council, at this time we have uh, recognitions. I'll go to Council Member Banks McLaughlin, special presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Is um, Demetria, is she here? Demetria Davis? Is she? Okay, if you mind coming up. 
I would like to um, recognize you. Do somebody mind reading it or? Why? Okay, thank you. I'll walk. Uh, Chris, since you are her spouse, would you like to, uh, to read it? Sure. And now present it. <laughs> So while we're waiting on um, Council Member Davis to read, I would like everybody to know that um, Miss Davis is a, a reigning beauty queen. She is Miss South Carolina International, and she was first runner up in a national pageant. So right here from Fayetteville. <laughs> Thank you all. <clears throat> Proclamation reads, whereas Demetria Washington Davis was named 2022 North Carolina Mother of the Year by America Mothers Inc. And whereas America Mothers Inc. recognizes amazing mothers who come from diverse backgrounds and experiences across the nation. These women are recognized for their work, resilience and commitment to family and community. And whereas Demetria is a mother of five, Kiana, Christian, Darren, Britton and Lily, a grandmother of one, as well as a mother figure to many young men and women that she has mentored. And whereas Demetria was a track and field star at Terry Sanford and the University of South Carolina, she's a six-time NCAA champion and was part of the women's outdoor track and field team that won the 2002 NCAA National Championship. Her 21 All-American honors remain the most in the University of South Carolina school history. She began competing professionally at the college and in 2003 was part of the four by four meter relay team that won the gold medal at the world championships. Dimitri decided to take her lifelong love of cooking to the next level and started D's Champion Cuisine, a catering business in January, 2021. Her heart is in serving others as she serves the community alongside her husband as pastors of Force of Life Fayetteville, a non-denominational ministry and on the joint city County Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. Now, therefore, I, Mitch Colvin, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and on behalf of the city of more than 208,000 citizens, do hereby honorably proclaim the 30th day of April in the year of 2022 to be in honor of Demetria Davis, North Carolina Mother of the Year. In witness whereof, I have unto set my hand and caused the great seal of the city of Fayetteville to be affixed this 21 day of March, 2022. Signed, Mayor Mitch Colvin. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, shut sure now. What's up with the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> You're probably eating. <laughs> stop, stop. I saw a point. Small bit. Thank you. I guess we'll take one afterwards. Yeah, you gotta say something. Oh. I don't want to be long because I know you guys probably have a lot on the agenda, but I just wanted to thank um, the mayor and the council for this um, amazing award. Oh gosh, here comes the tears. Um, but when they called me about this award, I did cry because there's so many amazing mothers here in North Carolina and here in Fayetteville on the council as well. And it really, really, really means a lot to me to be able to represent North Carolina as the mother of the year. I just want to leave a legacy and my what I always do is I just live from my heart and I make my life a platform for God to show and to show through me and in when it affects people I'm just gracious and so this award has definitely changed my life and my family's life and I wouldn't be a mother without my amazing husband of course um, Christopher <laughs> Davis so Thank you, babe. We call each other babe. And thank you all for um, this award and for this. It is truly, truly an honor. And thank you, Mama Kathy. That's my mama, my other mama. 
My uh, mom is back here with my kids, but she's my other mom, uh, Mama Bear. So thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis and uh, Councilman, you sure married up there, sir. Um, so uh, I'll That's go to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jensen, and if we could have Mr. Steve Goodson, if you could meet me at the podium. Oh, okay. I believe the mayor and the mayor pro tem. Very good. <clears throat> Thrilled to read this proclamation. Whereas on March 25th, 1821, the people of Greece declared their independence and liberty from the Ottoman Empire, which had occupied Greece for nearly 400 years. And whereas on that day, Bishop Germanus of Patras raised the Greek flag at the monastery of Aegea Lavras, inciting the Peloponnese to rise against their oppressors. And whereas the ancient Greeks developed the concept of democracy in which supreme power to govern was vested in the people, which assisted the founding fathers of the United States in forming our representative democracy. And whereas Greek Independence Day is celebrated with patriotic speeches parades and military demonstrations. Across Greece, there are parades organized by schools where children march with the Greek flag while dressed in traditional customs. And whereas this year marks the 201st anniversary of the beginning of the revolution that freed the Greek people from the Ottoman Empire, now therefore, Mitch Colvin, mayor of the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and on behalf of the city council and more than 208,000 citizens do hereby honorably proclaim the 25th day of March in the year 2022, Greek Independence Day, and urge all Fayetteville residents to learn more about our large Greek community and take part in celebrations of Greek independence with them. In witness whereof, Mayor Mitch Colvin has hereunto set his hand and caused the great seal of the city of Fayetteville to be affixed this 25th day of March, 2022. Congratulations. On behalf of the Greek community, we uh, certainly do appreciate this award and all the Greeks throughout the United States that migrated here many years ago. And uh, we are very appreciative of how we were received here and, and the work that uh, we do. We try to have a community that is part of everything. So uh, again, we thank you very much for uh, this honor and uh, we, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. At this time, we will move to a uh, uh, proclamation for doulas. If we can have Ms. Angela Malloy and those represented. Whereas birthing families are a priority in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and part of helping new parents is ensuring they receive community support to acquire and sustain maternal and infant health. Whereas, according to the Center of D Disease Control, March of Dimes, American College of Obstetrics, the Associations of Women's Health, Obstetric and neonatal nurses and other leading health organizations, community-based doula support is affected in improving birth outcomes. And whereas a parent's decision to have a doula should be supported by family members, the healthcare system, and the community. 
And whereas community-based doula assists birth result in less medical interventions, decreased rates for low birth weights for infants, decreased rates of birth and postpartum complications, improvement in black, black maternal health and reduction in black mortality and morbidity rates, increased rates of breastfeeding and improved mental health during the, the postpartum period. And whereas collaborating with community-based doulas supporting insurance re reimbursement for doula services and providing funding to community-based doula organizations can positively impact birth outcomes in our community. And whereas our community is proud to have one of the few community-based doula organizations, Mama's Village Fateville, and one of the largest community-based doula collectives, Mama's Village Doula Collective in North Carolina, located in downtown Fateville. And whereas by providing a welcoming environment for community-based doulas, this supports our families of all races and ethnicities to receive equal access to a doula from their community. And now, therefore, I, Mitch Colvin, Mayor of the City of Fayetteville, North Carolina, on behalf of the City Council and more than 208,000 citizens, do hereby honorably proclaim the week of March 29th through April 4th in the year 2022 as Community-Based Doula Week. In witness thereof, I hereon do set my hand in the cause of the great seal of the City of Fayetteville to be affixed this 21st day of March, 2022. Mayor Mitch Colvin. Is it any mic? Okay. First off, I want to also congratulate the city of Fayetteville because you are the first city in the entire state of North Carolina to do, um, do a proclamation for community-based doula week. So I want to give the city a hand. Hopefully other cities will lead the way. Um, this is an, important to us because we are doing a lot of work to address the maternal issues that are in this county. Um, hopefully many of you know that uh, if you're sitting on the council that we're not doing so well in our maternal health here in Cumberland County. And as you just heard in the proclamation, community-based doulas have been proven to be able to um, help with the outcomes that we have. And not only do you have one community-based organization, Mama's Village Fedville, but you also have another Divine Doula Goddess, um, community-based doulas. And we have with us visiting from Durham, uh, Maya Jackson with Mommy Inc. And we are not only just working in our county, but we're also working statewide to do a um, accreditation for our doulas around the state. And so we are thankful that you have recognized the work that we're doing in the community, but it doesn't stop there. We need the support, as we said, the organizations, we need to have funding to be able to do this work. So as you're considering how to um, deal with the, the funds that you get, especially with workforce development, we are looking to be able to have the conversations with you about how that can be effective um, in our community. If you have noticed New York, the, uh, the mayor just um, uh, declared having a policy and a program there, and we're hoping that Fayetteville, with it being the first in other things as well, will also um, be the first in bringing something like that to our city. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Oh, I, I would yes. also I would also like to add to the to the doula community, as someone who has not experienced childbirth yet. Um, and having friends who have recently become mothers, the work you have done within the community with some of my friends and also uh, helping me feel a bit comfortable about childbirth, if, if that is to happen for me, has been um, very, um, 
I'm getting emotional, has been a very uh, reassuring. And so I thank you. And, and one of the things that I hear a lot of from women like myself that go into the healthcare system is that they are not being listened to. And I've heard many times to where they have had one of you by their side and have felt heard. So thank you for the work that you do. And one thing I wanted to add, um, we're putting Fayetteville on the map when it comes to maternal health. Fayetteville also has the first and only community human milk bank located right downtown as well. And we're gonna be doing a presentation with uh, the milk bank in uh, Wake Med at a presentation, uh, a conference later on this year. And also, you know, as you mentioned about, you know, not having that voice, I'm usually one that they call in the hospital when there's some issues, you know, to help with our, you know, mothers because they shouldn't be fighting to have their voice heard while they're trying to bring life into this world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, the great work to the community. So keep up the good work. At this time, I'll go to Council Member Banks McLaughlin and ask that Reverend Cartwright and um, other members. Yes, um, it's um, Monty Harris, um, Marion Garvin, John Wells, Dr. Cartwright, and Herbert Scott. If you can come to the podium, please. And these, um, I'm gonna say young men, these young men that are coming towards the podium, these are community leaders. They do so much in our community and I wanted to take the time to acknowledge them. Um, not to say that these are the only ones, but these, this is a small handful of community leaders um, in my district. So again, I wanted to take the time to acknowledge you all. It's very important is very important of what all the things that you all do. Um, today, I wanted to acknowledge you and let you know how much I appreciate you all, which I've said that numerous occasions, but I wanted to not only tell you that, I wanted people to see your faces and know who you are. Um, each and every one of you have families, some of you have careers, but somehow you still make time to pour into our community. You are, are consistent, you keep me on my toes. And as a council member, you guys are my backbone. So I just wanna let you know how much I appreciate you all. And I hope that the viewers um, that are tuned in and the people that are sitting out in the audience, I hope that you look at them and try to take on that initiative. Going to community watch meetings and being involved is so vital. It keeps you in a loop of what's going on. Many times, residents will call them, then they call me, then I call our staff, and as a team, we get the issues resolved. So I just wanted to just take the time to thank you all for everything that you're doing in our community. And I have um, some awards down here that I wanna present you. Mr. Garvin, sir. Thank you, He's on his best behavior. If y'all know Mr. Garvin, this is so not him. He cuts up all the time. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate you all. John, this is like the security. We went to areas. Oh, my goodness. I'll just leave it at that. But this is like security. Um, Dr. Cartwright, thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Herbert Scott, thank you so much again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I pray that God continues to allow you to keep doing what you're doing in our community. Okay. And, I, and you guys are leading the way, and I hope others will follow suit. Thank you. Thank All you right, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Councilmember Banks. Thank you to uh, the leaders in District 8. Uh, you know, certainly this is a partnership between elected officials and the community so that we can all work to make the community a better place. So we couldn't do it without you. So thank you guys and keep up the good work. At this time, we'll move to uh, the city manager's report. It's the manager. Uh, yeah, I got you. Okay. And council, I know this is new for us tonight, but we'll, we'll try to uh, utilize the technology that we have, uh, that we've invested in. Uh, in order for you to speak, instead of the lights, we have the uh, iPad system, so we'll I'll be able to track uh, speakers. Mayor. Mr. So Mayor, please, mine is not on. Okay, so we'll need to get IT over to uh, to help assist with that. Um, so with that, I'll go to the city manager report, then I'll come to you, Councilmember Ingram, for the agenda approval. Mr. Manager, do you have any items? Yeah, uh, no, sir. No. All right, Councilmember Ingram. Yes, sir. I did have a quick announcement um, that I mentioned to you. So just on Friday, uh, April 1st, there will be a ceasefire community drive-in movie to one of my favorite movies right now, which is Encanto. Uh, that will be at uh, JS Spivey Rec Center, 500 Fisher Street. We look forward to uh, having fun with you uh, there and watching the movie. Um, and with that, I am prepared to uh, make. I do have a couple more speakers. So. Oh, okay. So See, the, you don't the want me to prove it yet? Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to okay. you. Say. All right, Councilmember Davis. Okay, Councilmember Kinston. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I wanted to announce that um, the volunteer uh, registration for the Fable Beautiful is starting um, to be open tomorrow. The event is actually on April 23rd, 2022. This is the opportunity to clean up your neighborhood, uh, select a street or an area that you want to concentrate on, and work to bring the Fable Beautiful. Uh, this is a uh, yearly event. It gives you the opportunity to join with your sororities, fraternities, your church members, your sports um, teams, but to come together to pick up any type of litter in your community. Um, all you have to do is go to fadebeautiful.com, uh, select the street or the area that you want to participate and clean up on, and then also just um, tag the picture for the most unusual item that you find. But again, this event is on April the 23rd, and we encourage all citizens to, to participate in the Federal Beautiful. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman McKinston. Uh, at this time, I'll go to Mayor Pro Tem Jensen for uh, item 6.0 to approve of the agenda. And uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to add two. Um, no, no, that, just to approve of the agenda. That's the consent agenda. No, it'll, be, it'll, it'll need to be added to consent. So it'll be a motion to approve the agenda with the addition of 7.013 and 4. Okay. Yep. Okay. So um, I would like to make a motion that we add 7.013, um, the PWC, somebody help me out here. Proposal. Proposal. And 7.04, the court order that was given to us for dismiss. All right, so if I get that correct, there's a motion to approve the agenda with the addition of items 7.013 and 7.014 as stated uh, by Mayor Pro Tem Jensen. Is there a second? Please press your buttons or a second. Second. Okay, all right. The second by Council, uh, Council Member uh, Ingram. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All right, council. All right. Still working through it. Madam Attorney, you had something during the discussion of, of this? Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to clarify for the items that were that are being added to the agenda tonight, that council did receive those items uh, for their consideration and uh, received them upstairs or they're down here at the dais. All right, and we'll, when we get to consent, I'm sure there'll be more discussion about those items. But thank you, Madam Attorney. Any other items for discussion? Mr. Mayor, um, I do not think any of us are able to vote. All right, so iPads. what we'll do, we'll, we'll revert back to a show of hands for those voting. I'll, I'll give them an uh, opportunity for those in favor and those against. I have a quick start voting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> probably probably okay, need to Okay, great. All right, we are so learning. All right, Council, we're working, working through it. All right, I so um, 
We'll do a show of hands on this with Jennifer, and we'll reboot it for the next because I'm not sure where I am with it. All right, there's a motion on the floor by Mayor Pro Tem Jensen. There was a second by uh, Council Member Ingram. Uh, discussion has been had. Those in favor of approval of the agenda with the additional items, those, show of hands. Those in favor? Uh, all right. Uh, those in favor of voting are Councilman Davis, Ingram, Dawkins, Jones, Wright, Colvin, Jensen, and Banks McLaughlin. Those voting opposed to the agenda approval, Council Members Kinston and Hare. Motion carries uh, eight to two. As we move to consent, um, any questions on consent? All right, seeing none, I need a motion to approve consent. All right, there's a motion by Council Member Wright to approve consent as seconded by Council Member Davis. Any discussion on the motion for consent? All right, show of hands, those approving consent. Those voting in favor? All right, those voting in favor, Councilman Davis, Dawkins, uh, Jones, Wright, Colvin, and Banks McLaughlin. Those voting opposed? Council members Ingram, Jensen, Hare, and Kinston. Motion carries six to four. Uh, moving on to the next item, uh, item 8.01. Uh, United States Department of Justice report. Mr. Dion Lyons and his team are here. Uh, Mr. Lyons, welcome, sir. Uh, you can come to the podium, and I think uh, our human relations has been working in tandem with you, so I'll turn the floor over to you. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council Members. My name is Yamil Nazar. I have been your DEI Director since sometime in January. I am going to... Can you say what that means just for those Oh, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director for the Human Relations Department. Thank you. My apologies. Too long. Uh, I am going to introduce our Chairwoman, Simone Pemberton, who was appointed to the Commission in October of 2019. One year later, she was elected Secretary and was subsequently elected Chairwoman in September of 2021. Outside of the Commission, Simone is heavily invested in the betterment of the community. She is an avid volunteer with local organizations. In 2020, she founded BrighterStill.org, a nonprofit that provides free, on-demand life skills training to those transitioning from homelessness and individuals re-entering society, youth, and any interested community member. In addition to this, Simone is an active member of the Fayetteville Cumberland County Continuum of Care. Her professional background is in business, marketing, and real estate. And for one second, I would like to introduce those commissioners and former commissioners who are in the audience. And I'm going to start from the back with former Commissioner Peterson. And then uh, Dr. Lowry is current. Eric Washington, who's a first staff sergeant. The sergeant first class. Sorry, I can never remember these things. Uh, Eric Washington, Mr. Milton, who's a current uh, commissioner. Uh, Mr. Palmer, who is also a current commissioner. And Ms. Warren. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. And I get the honor of introdu introducing Mr. Dion Lyons. Uh, Mr. Lyons is a conciliation specialist with the Region 4 Atlanta Office of the Department of Justice Community Relations Service. He is responsible for helping communities with conflicts involving Civil Rights Act and hate, per or, excuse me, hate Crimes Prevention Act protected categories in Georgia and North Carolina. Mr. Lyons is a retired Army judge advocate with eight combat deployments. Mr. Ly Mr. Lyons has a Bachelor of Science from Florida A&M University, a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law, and an LLM from the Army Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm here to introduce some of the results from a pretty intensive endeavor that we took on as a result of the request of the city of Fayetteville and several of the community members that I came here and addressed last year 
uh, around this time. City Spirit is a, a procedure that we have refined over several years in the Department of Justice Community Relations Service. But since very few people know who, what, what the Community Relations Service is, I'd like to I'd like to give a brief overview of who the Community Relations Service is and what we do. Then I'd like to go very briefly into the standard City Spirit program. And then I'd like to explain why and how we deviated from that standard program in our two different iterations of the City Spirit that we, we did here in Fayetteville. So let me see. OK. CRS is a very small agency within the Department of Justice that was established by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then it, the jurisdiction was expanded by the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act of 2009. I'll try to go over this as quickly as possible because it is quite extensive. And the reason that the presentation is so extensive is because I don't have the authority to edit it down to just what we need here. So I'll just kind of, if you see me skipping slides, that's the reason why. City Spirit stands for City Site Problem Identification and Resolution of Issues Together. So I was originally asked to come to Fayetteville in the wake of an incident that happened around and involving the market house and the mural that was painted and then removed around the market house a year or so ago. At that time, the market house was just one of several issues that, uh, that, the, that the people here in Fayetteville asked to be addressed. So I gave a similar presentation then to a group of selected community members and stakeholders who had a variety of different issues they, they'd, like for, they'd like for an opportunity to weigh in on so that stakeholders and leaders and elected officials in the community could have that information to base their decisions upon. In between the time I came and gave that presentation and the time I actually uh, began to do the City Spirit program, the issues were whittled down. Um, a decision was made that we should focus only on the key issue that, that kind of sparked the flame here in Fayetteville, and that was the market house and what is to become of it. The market house seemed to be the, the lightning rod of a lot of community tension. Our job here in the Community Relations Service is to reduce community tension. It seems that uh, some of my slides that, that discuss what the Community Relations Service mission is are, are not here. And so I'll just give you a very brief overview. Our mission is simply just to reduce tension wherever we, we can and try and bring the community together to identify issues and solutions that leaders in the community can implement. We do that by a variety of different methods and means. One of them and the most efficient of them is facilitated dialogues. And that's what the City Spirit Program is, is really about. It is a facilitated dialogue that the community has an opportunity to weigh in in a way that is, uh, allows for free interaction, but in a controlled manner. It's okay. going the wrong way. It should, there are slides in the beginning that are missing. Okay. That's okay. I can, I can just talk through it. So, in general, we come to communities that have a, um, that, have, that have some type of community outcry or community unrest. And we try to, try to find a solution that will reduce that tension and allow the community to go, to go forward in a peaceful manner. There was some unrest around the market house in the year or so ago that I was here. And so I, call, I came to Fayetteville and presented this program as one of the possible solutions to gather 
a consensus from the community on what, what might be done to assist. The market house was one of the issues, but it became the central focus of the SPIRIT program when we actually put it into place. So I'll tell you how that went or how it was supposed to go and why we modified it. And then we'll get into the results, which Dr. Pimbleton and Dr. Nazar, I'm sorry, Mrs. Nazar will help us go through. As I said, it's the site problem identification and resolution of issues together. It is a system whereby you bring the community into the room, volunteers and stakeholders. We try to, we try to have that uh, cross section of the community be diverse in such a way that they represent different aspects of the community from the business community to the faith-based community, the education community, the youth, the business community, oh, I already said the business, elected officials, law enforcement, and any other civil rights or civil liberty organizations or any community group that feels that they would like to speak up. We, we bring those different aspects of the community into one big room on one long day. We have each of those different stovepipes of the community work within their own groups in the first half of the day. And that first half of the day is dedicated to identifying the issues that need to be addressed because usually that's one of the biggest, um, most divisive things. What do we need to be working on? Where should we put our resources and our efforts? We go through uh, brainstorming in a controlled manner a brainstorming program to identify those issues and then find out what is most important to each of those stovepipes I previously identified. Then there's a voting process that allows each of those stovepipes to, within their own group, decide what's most important to them. Then they brief out that uh, decisions that they've made on the top three or four issues within each group. So the business community says what's most important to them the education community, the law enforcement, et cetera. They brief it out to everyone in the room so everyone can understand what concerns that group the most. Then everyone in the room goes through a democratic process of voting, very simple, not technological at all. They just decide based on the butcher boards that each group presented, what's the most important issue of all of the issues that each of the groups presented. Those top three or four issues are then divided into and uh, concentrated on to be that the issues that we will work on for the rest of the day to come up with detailed solutions for those problems. And at that point, there's a transition to the second half of the day where each of those stovepipes that were previously identified get mixed up. Now, there's a representative from each of those stovepipe organizations in each of the groups that are working on solutions. So what we've done, and the reason we do it this way, is because we like to build consensus through understanding of what's important to each of those groups. And then have each of those groups who don't normally work together now spread and, and uh, intermingle and have the opportunity to listen to every other, as every other point of view on those issues that were agreed upon as the most important. I know that's a little confusing. This chart sometimes helps. So we've identified the issues in our stovepipes. They go through the process of analyzing those issues. Then we break those groups out of the stovepipes into mixed groups to deal with the solutions. Those solutions have to be detailed. They have to have timelines. They have to have funding sources and strategies. And they, they need to then be briefed out the who, the what, the when, where, why, and how, back out to the main party, the main body, as they assemble back together. What we hope that this process does 
is identify and build consensus and address solutions with resources and timelines that can then result in an action plan that then can be utilized by the decision makers and the resource providers to implement into real world results. That's how the city spirit process is supposed to work. But as I said, we deviated when we came, when I came back here in October and then again in January to actually do the program. The reason that we deviated is because the first half of the day is usually spent identifying what issues need to be addressed. But that work was already done. When I returned in October, I learned that Fayetteville had decided we were only going to concentrate on the reutilization of the market house. And there was still, that being the most controversial issue at the, at the time, there were still very many questions about how that was to be done and a consensus needed to be built. So there are many reasons why city spirit results in uh, a ready-made consensus and an action plan that people already have debated out and grown support for. It increases mutual understanding in the communication between leaders, facilitates that mutual agreement as a part of the process as those groups get changed and mixed up. These are the details of how the city spirit is conducted, but I've already gone over that in enough detail that what I'd like to get to now is what actually happened on the ground as opposed to what is supposed to happen. We did establish a planning group. We identified, we identified facilitators from the Fayetteville HRC and from the group that was identified a little earlier here, sitting in the second and first rows. They were the actual facilitators of the program, both in October and again in January. It's usually done only once on one long day. We had to do it twice here in Fayetteville because during the time that I arrived in October, there were COVID considerations that restricted the number of participants from usually over 80 to 100. There was a 50 person limit put in place by the Department of Justice for these programs when I arrived in October. So since there were more than 50 people who wanted to participate, we bifurcated the program from just one long day to two slightly less long days, still very productive. There was community engagement, there was community voice. We did agree upon action plans twice and the working group and task force was very productive and very flexible. We did have a city spirit planning group uh, that was basically the Fayetteville HRC. These are the groups that we normally have for a, for a city spirit. I said we usually break down into stovepipes. We would normally have law enforcement, civil rights leaders, faith-based leaders. Instead, what we did in October and January was we broke, we broke the groups down into the different aspects of the market house reutilization plan. We were given five options. And so when we first brought everyone into the room, instead of sitting them in their stovepipes, we just let them randomly sit in the room wherever they wanted to sit, not knowing what group that they would be advocating for. That way we got a random sampling of different people's perspectives, but we, we made each group in the room concentrate on one of the five different aspects of the market house reutilization plan. So instead of having stovepipes based around normal community uh, organization, leaders, law enforcement, civil rights leaders, we had groups in the room concentrate on the artistic aspects of the market house, the commercial aspects of the market house, the structural aspects of the market house, and various other of the five different um, different considerations that we had on how to improve and reutilize the market house in Fayetteville. What we did then 
is our normal brainstorming in those different groups. But because each of the people participating didn't have the opportunity to choose their group and didn't know what group they were going to be advocating for, when we went to the second half and identified, the, after they identified the issues for that group, we then gave people the choice. We let them decide what they were most passionate about now that they had a familiarization for what each group had come up with in their brainstorming. And then we sent, we gave them the choice to, to go where they wanted to go. For instance, if someone who randomly got put into the structural improvement group decided that they were more passionate about the artistic or the marketing aspect of the market house, we allow them to go to those groups for the second half. So in that first half, we identified the changes that were important to the, the, the different aspects that were identified in advance. Then we split everybody out to go to where their passion was so they could tease out the details of an action plan on that particular aspect that they were most passionate about. So I, I hope I haven't thoroughly confused you all. And I'd like to, at this point, open it up for questions from either the, the city council or from the, the audience to clarify what I just said, because at the end of that, I'm going to ask Ms. Pemberton and Ms. Nazar to come up and go through the results. And I'll be standing by for uh, questions about the specifics that were, that, were, um, that were the product of a very, a very passionate and concerned and very knowledgeable community that wanted to see the market house um, reutilized in a way that they could support. So if there are questions, and I know that there, there must be because the slideshow didn't really help to deconflict it. Uh, well, well, just to make sure we're clear on that, Mr. Lyons, so there's a second half to this presentation that will have more specifics as to what actually happened. You just basically gave us the overview of the process. Is that right? I wanted you to understand how we came to the recommendations and action plan that we will present before you. Though the action plan is, is I compiled all the results from October and January and put them together in the format that explains how things actually happened on the ground because without that, it would just seem like random people just deciding that they want to suggest this or that. So you needed to understand the process in order to understand the value of the action plan and the work that went into it that is coming before you today. Thank you. So, Council, if we could, uh, I wouldn't get too far, Mr. Lyons. I'm sure there'll be several. But I, I guess if you all want to come with the action, actionable part of it, and then we'll open the floor up for Council questions. OK, thank you. <clears throat> Um, so I'm not going to, uh, part of what I had here was, was a little bit of what he covered, so I'm going to skip over that part. Um, but I will go through some of the results uh, that came through, and I won't go through each proposed solution, but I will highlight and read a few of them. I'm going to read, read it so I capture it accurately. <clears throat> Excuse me. Both groups want to see the market house as a symbol of education. They want the true comprehensive story of the history of the market house to be told. Both groups want to see the market house handicap accessible and ADA compliant. They want to see vibrant displays of art that connect market house visitors with activities that promote positive emotional responses and insight. It would feature various genres of art that represent African American culture and history, as well as an alternate, an alternate space that is representative of Fayetteville. There were recommendations to enclose the arches to allow the structure to be secured once the proposed solutions are implemented. They recommend quarterly displays of art exhibits that rotate themes and genres, such as dance, music, visual arts, spoken word, et cetera, all of these by local artists of various age ranges. History tours that explain the true history from 1832 to 2022, 
have artists collaborate with historians, anthropologists, sociologists for the framework of exhibits for um, accuracy. There was a strong desire to use art to educate, holograms showing relevant images from that period. And there was an example of an exhibit in DC in the, at the Holocaust Museum where they're doing this type of thing. Spoken word, short films, educational videos, temporary or removable murals on large hanging panels so it doesn't disrupt the structure at all. It can actually hang from the rafters. There were recommendations to expand the focus of the market house to include the four corners of Market Square. In the four corners, we would celebrate the rich diversity of the Fayetteville community while keeping the market house specific to black history. There were recommendations to change the name of the market house to something that acknowledges generations of the past, present, and future. There were recommendations to remove the Black Lives Matter mural surrounding the market house and replace it with a mural depicting the progression of history, again, past, present, and future. This unveiling for that specific initiative, they would like to happen Juneteenth of this year. This is a small sample of some of the ideas that came from uh, the community. So where do we go from here? The Human Relations Commission has formed an ad hoc committee, and that's led by our vice chairwoman, Millette Harris. It includes 10 um, participants, five from the first session, which occurred in um, October, thank you, October of 21, and five from the second session, which happened this year, January 25th. That also includes two members of the Fayetteville Cumberland uh, Youth Council. So the purpose of this committee is to sort through the many proposed solutions that you have in this report, prioritize them based on the short-term and long-term ability to implement and present specific solutions to you. So Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council members, we ask that you receive the report and allow us an opportunity to come back with formal suggestions, uh, recommendations from the Fayetteville Cumberland Human Relations Commission and the Ad Hoc Committee. Thank you. And now we open to any questions you have. All right. Um, so, Council, we'll try to uh, utilize our, our process again. I did have a question, and then, uh, uh, Madam Clerk, if you're tracking any 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 questions, because I don't, uh, I do see I do see uh, Council Members Banks, uh, Ingram, and Hare. Uh, I did have a question. So, um, Ms. Lyons, so just to make sure I'm understanding it right. The group that you compiled to put together, I was looking for it in your, in your report. It said typically you use a cross section of people's, people who represent different uh, constituencies, I guess, uh, from faith leaders, business community, those are those stove pipes you were talking about. Yes, sir. But then you said, let me get to it. Yeah, so typically your, your model shows that, that it's City spirits typically consist of city county leaders, law enforcement, civil rights, faith-based, uh, community-based organizations, nonprofits, and youth. You said something was different here. What was it, uh, and why? Why did you have to deviate from the normal mix of? So, those those constituents still participated. It's just that we didn't put them in stovepipes by who they represented meaning we didn't make all the law enforcement professionals start off in their same in, in one group. We didn't make all the faith-based leaders stay in another group. We, we had them randomly sit wherever they wanted to because the Fayetteville Market House had already, I'm sorry, the issue of what to do with the Fayetteville Market House had already been subdivided into five different options that uh, needed to be addressed. So. Instead of having, say, law enforcement community weigh in specifically on what they thought was most important to them, Fayetteville had already decided what was, in, what was going to happen, that uh, there needed to be a reutilization of the market house. So what Fayetteville wanted to know was how do we how do, we do that in such a way that the community can support? We want the, the input on how to do it best. So instead of different areas of the community weighing in, we had everybody weigh in on the different aspects of the market house. It just made more sense. I got you. So, so basically, instead of having 
uh, community leaders and faith leaders over here and, and right. law enforcement over here, you had everyone set randomly, and then Correct. you used that cross-section of people to, to start working from that point. Correct. Yes, okay. sir. All right. I understand that. All right. I'll go to Council Member Banks, McLaughlin, and then Ingram, and then Hare. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first and foremost, um, thank you for being here on um, today. Um, I do have two questions. Uh, the first question is um, regarding the meetings. Was those meetings open to the public? That's my first question. You mean the actual um, events that we had in October and January? Yes. Was it open to the entire public, rather virtual, okay. in person? So the it it wasn't. It wasn't uh, free for all, meaning anyone could come in off the street. Everyone was welcome, but there was a limit on how many people, and the HRC decided uh, how those people were selected. So, who decided on how they were selected? Human uh, relations. So, we had the first group, which was the Market House Repurposing Working Group. We had each of them provide names, and then we had the Human Relations Commissioners provide up to ten names. Okay, so they were not open to the public, and they were handpicked. Um, and I'm gonna just be just transparent about transparent about this. Originally, when this was brought up, as far as um, the the market house, one of the concerns were allowing the res the citizens in Fayetteville to have input and to be a part of the decision making. Just like you mentioned, a decision was made before the citizens had the opportunity to have any input and that was to repurpose the market house. When in reality, the citizens should have had that say so. We voted um, to have it on a referendum. Now if we speaking about wanting citizens input and be transparent, that should have been a time where the entire council supported allowing it be put on a referendum. So therefore, every resident, every voting resident would have had the opportunity, whether they supported the market house being demolished, repurposed, whatever it should have been. You guys shouldn't even have to be here today. So after, um, after all the questions, I, do, I would like to make a motion and my motion is to have the, um, it put on a referendum for the November 22nd, to, I mean, November 2022 ballot. So therefore, the residents can have the opportunity to make that decision. Because after that, we'll be going back and forth and to continue to be pushed down the road. And that's my motion. All right, we'll come back for a motion uh, on the floor. I think we still have a couple more questions. Uh, Councilman Banks, but I'll circle back to you. Um, Councilmember Ingram. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I had two questions. It, was a, it mostly is about um, citizen partici participation. Um, we will be receiving a presentation from the committee handling uh, our Juneteenth festival. And I did ask in our prior meeting that if there could be some partnered uh, initiative to have some uh, presence at Juneteenth to be able to get more input um, surrounding this. I as I was reading the workshop, the workshop uh, brief, I went down and I started reading where it said a total of approximately 80 community leaders participated in two sessions from the following. And I, and I read out all of the organizations. And um, I think what brings concern to me about the organizations um, is that some of the organizations that are mentioned in here um, kind of are within the reason of our issues. And, and I would like to offer us that we revisit this and figure it out, um, to figure out how to best move away from really the organizations and get to the people. Um, because these, the organizations listed here are, they make a lot of decisions, you know, their boards make a lot of decisions for the city. And what we saw um, in 2020 was 
you know, it's individuals my age wanting to have a voice and wanting to be included. And I don't really see that reflective within this the organization. I thank you for the work that you've done. I just don't necessarily see it reflective. And it's not just about, you know, my age. I'm, I'm thinking about this entire city, but I just don't necessarily see it a reflective. So my second part of that is, this is something that I felt that was a bit problematic, and I want to ask if it came up to you. Did our historian um, participate in these these sessions? <clears throat> Mr. Dobbs was part of the Market House Repurposing Working Group, the initial group. Okay. So one of the things that I found very problematic about, um, I guess, our historian was that up until... Um, things hit the ceiling, there was a denial of the full truth of the market house. And I think that moving forward, I think we should also look at maybe not just having one historian, but opening that field up to where maybe we have a, a full board that could talk, that could focus on the history of the market house. So there are multiple perspectives, but I do find that to be a bit problematic that, you know, that was the experience. Um, could I get some feedback from you on that? I, I don't. You were part yeah, I don't, I don't think I uh, was involved in that aspect. By the time uh, I came in in October, both the decision that the councilwoman spoke about as to narrowing the topic as to what was to be done with the market house uh, and the historian issue had already taken place. I was there s simply to facilitate the, uh, the program. Okay, now let me ask this final question and I'll, be, I'll move on, Mr. Mayor. Um, you, you're asking us to accept the report, and you will come back and do what again? We will come back with formal recommendations, which will include logistics, um, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And that's from the Fayetteville Cumberland Human Relations Commission and the Ad Hoc Committee. Okay. I would also like to, to ask within when you go back to revisit that, to also look into how we handle the history of the market house in terms of our historian, or if there can be a recommendation to add members to have multiple historians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Councilman Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you all for your report tonight. I had several questions, but when I heard how the citizen participation was put together, it kind of pushed my other questions back because one of our big things with this particular subject matter was the involvement of our citizens. And I think that's very, very important. You, you said, I think, that the space, because we were right in the middle of COVID, and I do understand that. So the space, I assume, prohibited a large group no no it wasn't this it wasn't a spacing issue okay. uh, the facility we used actually had plenty of space and we we did use COVID precautions to space things out as much as uh, as safe and reasonable the issue was that just before I arrived in October the um, Department of Justice had a requirement that restricted the amount of people that we could have at our events. Any event that we were involved in, any, any event that we facilitated, there was a 50 person limit and that was throughout uh, the Department of Justice throughout the United States at the time. So if that was the case, your guidelines, could not you have had various meetings? Yes. Yes, we could have done as many kind of, iterations as yeah. as was needed. Yes. Yeah, because I think that was that's to me, from my perspective, is is very very important uh, with us moving on since we have gotten to the point to where um, we're at a repurposing uh, stage. Um, but I still will ask those other questions that I, I had in mind. You said uh, 
that it's a recommendation from the committee. Well, I think I'll just kind of leave my questions where they are, Mayor, because, like I said, because of the participation and how that was done, I don't know if my questions really, uh, because they're just kind of just going to this specific uh, committee. So thank you for uh, the questions, Mayor. All right, thank you. So, Council, just to recap, this has been, uh, you know, just to bring everyone up to speed with where we are uh, before we look to either receive a report or some other action. I need, do need the city attorney, I think, needs to clarify something for us. But uh, in 2020, it was, it was, it was presented to Council uh, on a couple of different Council meetings that there were really uh, three choices, I think, were presented. Uh, one was to uh, remove the market house. One was to leave it alone. One was to repurpose it, and uh, one was to relocate. And I think council worked through that in a number of meetings and ended up that removal and relocation and leaving it alone were not uh, the options. And so that only left the repurposing, which at that time, uh, City Spirits had came in initially, I think, uh, Mr. Lange may refresh it, right after things happened, or a few months after things happened in, in 2020, uh, right when Right when, the when the issues the took place, June, early June, late May, something to that effect. And I think you guys came in a few months after that and came back and started your process. So um, this council, keep in mind, is, is just one of the ways to engage the community because I do remember we discussed surveys. We thought about sending out how many surveys, how expensive it was. We talked about that. Uh, we talked about a referendum, which I'll get the city attorney to tell us what the, the rules are to put something on the ballot. Uh, but I think that the, the goal is, is to get as much community input and conversation. This does not have to be the only method, but it is a method that we got, and the Department of Justice did it at no cost to the city, which was a useful model for us to use to be able to engage diverse opinions at the same time. And so I know that they have tried that since the 1960s when things were real hot with racial and civil rights issues. So their model uh, helped us to get to this point. Uh, but now it's not necessarily saying that uh, the decisions, all decisions are made. I think that from what I'm hearing from several council members, uh, you wanna continue to get citizen input. Now I think some of the questions as to how you, how the groups were pulled together, how many people were talked to, and all of that to make sure that those perspectives were diverse, that you not only took a group of supporters and broke those up into what it was that caused them to support it, whether it's history, education, or something, we want to make sure that you've got some folks who don't support the idea at the table, too. So I think that's what we've got to try to work our way toward, figure out how it is. I think regardless of it, um, as much as we want to, we're not going to be able to hear from 208,000 different opinions about how to fix it. And, then, and so we, we'll just try to get the best information, make the best decision for the community in the long term, I think, is what the council's intent is. But we don't have all the answers tonight, and neither do, do these guys. But this is just a step in that direction. But, um, Madam Attorney, before I go to Council Member, uh, well, I do have some other questions uh, with Kenston, Jensen, and Wright. But can you clarify what the conversation was about putting things on the, on the uh, ballot as a referendum? Mr. Mayor, as I recalled, uh, this question did come up about uh, having a referendum, and uh, what I shared was that North Carolina state law uh, specifies what can be um, put to a referendum vote, and this is not one of those items. Okay, all right, I'll go to Council Members Kinston, Mayor Pro Tem, and then Council Member Wright. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So I do wanna make sure that I understand that you're saying that we would receive the report, but at the same time, because the decision was already made of the ideas that you're bringing back to us, that doesn't include all the citizens' opinions. I did hear the word art a lot, um, but I think it's gonna be very beneficial, as some of the other council members mentioned, that there's a wide variety of citizens that we have not even touched and even had a conversation with. So if we're opening back up where we can do other workshops and other events, I think it's important that we do workshops or either make a way that those citizens that have not had a voice be able to weigh in on some of the ideas that may have not even been discovered or talked about at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro uh, Council Member Kinston. Uh, Mayor Pro Tim Jensen and then Wright. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I just wanted to um, go back a little bit when 
Mr. Lyons, when you first came to us. And one of the things that you said was um, when everything happened in 2020, we needed time to digest what was needed for us to start the conversations and what we're doing right now. And when you came and said that to us, because people were asking, why didn't you come sooner? And you sat and looked at us and said, it wasn't the right timing. Right. And I just wanted to say that I appreciate the report that y'all are giving to us because I think it showed to me you knew exactly what you were talking about to get 50 people in a room that are very diverse and have different beliefs and things like that to come up with a report like this and even sitting here in a full house that we are seeing people shake their heads one way and shaking their heads the other way. But what I do see is that everybody wants something to come through it and we want the conversations to continue. So thank you for starting the conversations and as I would say, always biting the elephant off a little bit that we have to eat. And I look forward to us continuing as a council to keep the, it open to our citizens. But I just wanted to personally say thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, council Member Wright, and then second round for Council Member Banks McGlough. I just want to also thank you for the time and energy that you guys have put in and also for the presentation. But I do feel strongly uh, because of the, uh, the seriousness and the magnitude of, of the market house and the history on both sides, we have uh, really, really um, high emotions on both sides, and we want to make sure uh, as the uh, voting body that we do it the right way. And we certainly want to get more citizens' input. Uh, when you're dealing with uh, over 208,000 citizens of, of the city, um, you know, we have to be very careful that we can hear from every, you know, area or every group per se. And I like what uh, some have said uh, to hear the negatives and the positives, the pros and the cons. And so I was thinking um, because it's kind of like this is our first bite at the apple and we don't need to, you know, rush into trying to fix something that we want to make sure we do it the right way. Uh, social media um, with a questionnaire with several questions. Maybe you get a panel to say these are the most important questions that our citizens need to confront or answer. Uh, maybe, you know, 10 questions, send it out, see what you get back, analyze it percentages wise. Then that's just one way of kind of, you know, getting uh, a, a, a feel of how the community feels about it in these three categories. And then from there, have an open forum of some sort, media-wise, Zoom-wise, however we need to do to reach the maximum as we can that you know makes sense when you're doing surveys mm -hmm. uh, to see what the community really, really wants and to see which is best for our community. So I appreciate what you, what you have here, and I, I agree with some that I think we need to really look at uh, touching every aspect of our community and getting input from young, old, uh, rich, poor, whites, uh, blacks, every spectrum of society, and then getting the full history uh, of the market house in order to educate people to say why is this important to you and why isn't it important to you, to give people education so that kind of an educated voice in the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Wright. Uh, Councilman Jones, uh, Councilman Banks McLaughlin, I'll come back to you for a second round. Let me get some of the, the folks who haven't spoken. So, Councilman Jones, and then uh, I think England, the second round as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's somewhat disheartening to, to honestly um, hear the, the lack of community input on this. Uh, and I appreciate the report, I do. I'm definitely not knocking that. Um, the reason I say that usually when uh, surveys uh, are taken, I know there are different models, things of that nature, your sample size really, really, to me personally, uh, needs to be fairly large so that you can get a variety of, of uh, uh, you can get a lot of input and you can actually 
Uh, to me, it would be more representative of, of the total community. I know maybe uh, restating what some of the other council members have said, but to me that's important uh, before moving to any actionable steps simply because, uh, again, at the end of the day, just being very transparent, I know it, whatever the actions or will be, we may not necessarily please everyone, but the goal is for, for me and I think for, for a lot of the others sitting here and maybe even out there uh, is to make sure at the end of the day that we have done the best, our very best in hearing, eliciting, even evaluating what the community says, what they desire. And to me, with that component missing, it's, it's challenging to, to move forth with certain, certain actions. And I understand the parameters that you were working with at that particular time. I totally understand that. I, I hope, again, that there's some sort of, of way that we can revisit uh, that, that community aspect. Uh, it, it's just that, that, uh, that, that sample size just to me is, is somewhat problematic for me. And again, it doesn't negate uh, the, the process that you have in place because I know, I know it works. You know you've used it in different places. Uh, but for me, again, just to have at least an increase in community input, that would put me more at ease in regards to we have appropriately heard from the community to the best of our ability. Again, what that looks like, that's, that's up, and up for debate. But uh, for me, I believe we really, really need to involve the community a little bit more. And uh, again, it was, it was just personally disheartening, not, not, not the report, just hearing that, that lack of, of, of input, uh, that, that lack of input. So, but thank you again for the report. I can see the work that, that has gone into it and um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. All right, thank you, Councilmember Jones. Um, two points before I go to Councilmember Bank, uh, Banks McLaughlin and then Ingram. Madam Attorney, can you give a little bit more detail about uh, what it is that qualifies or, or doesn't regarding referendums? Just so that the listening audience is tracking that. Mr. Mayor, um, the, um, what the North Carolina uh, state law says is that there must be some authorization for the referendum. So it's not a matter of uh, municipalities, any types of local government just deciding that there is a question that they want to have for a referendum, but it must be set out by state law that it is something for which a referendum could be held. Does that answer your question? Some, somewhat, so, so in other words, it's, it's, it's not to be used as a poll, but it's to give authority to either add an extra tax or to build something or to do something. Is that what you're saying? It lays that out. Can you get that later for us so we can be able to share it with our constituents? I know that you may have to look up the specific language on it. Absolutely, but. I think uh, previously I sent the council a uh, blog post from the School of Government. Mm -hmm. and I'll be happy to uh, get that out, hopefully, uh, either depending on what, what time we leave this evening, it may be tomorrow. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, um, and, and heading to Councilmember Banks McLaughlin. Uh, Council, remember, at the end of this, we have human relations, which we can instruct to do whatever it is Council chooses to do. So, you know, as we've talked about this, uh, saying we definitely need more diverse opinions at the table, I think that, you know, the Pastors Coalition or, or some of the NAACP, you know, some of those names were missing. I don't know the people. You said it was not organizations. In this model, it was people. So I don't know who these folks represented. But we just want to make sure that, that there are people who are for whatever decision and those against it, and maybe those who have another perspective that, that we want to hear to get as many people to the table. Um, and, and so there are multiple steps can be taken. The, the details to the, to the how it's executed and, and what it's looked like, you know, I'm, I'm confident in uh, our human relations folks, that's what they do, is to make sure that they bring and blend uh, opinions together on, on racial and, and civil type, civil justice type things. So that is always an option. So I'll go to Councilmember Banks McLaughlin and then Ingram and then uh, look for some action from us, Council. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and before then, I did have a motion, but it's not showing on my screen. But I, right, I did want to mention, okay, right. But I, I did want to mention that just like you mentioned, it's, I guess, kind of hard to get um, over 200,000 
citizens' input. As the city attorney mentioned, we're unable to do a referendum. So I would like to see, well, I'm making a motion that we go back to the drum board and eliminate all the options to restore it so that the community can, if we're speaking of wanting a community to have a say so, that's what we should do. So basically going back to the beginning and restore, take all the options off and have these meetings to allow the residents to come in, or sessions, whatever you want to call it, have the, the residents come in and let them, the citizens come in and let them make that ultimate decision because this, again, the decision should not have been made without any input. And that's my motion. All right, so there's a motion by Councilmember Banks McLaughlin to, uh, I know to remand this back to human relations, but when you're saying to start all options, is that what you mean? Re restate it for me just Yes, take everything off, off the table and start as if we are starting from the beginning with options. Okay. Right now, no, because originally we had to um, repurpose, the demolish the market house, to relocate it. I feel that it need to go back to the, re the citizens and allow them to come to the table and have a say-so. All right. There's a motion by Councilmember Banks McLaughlin. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Kinston. Yes. Discussion on the motion. Uh, I still I'll go to Councilmember Ingram and Wright. Um, thank you. So I, I do want. I want to take a trip back to 2016, 2017, and during that time, and I'm just going to very briefly um, read uh, something that um, may help help us all out here. Um, WPR was asked to design a community-wide facilitated discussion in order to provide feedback to the city council as to where or not the market house should be removed from the city seal, and if so, what should replace it. Six community meetings were held across the city, and specific comments made at each of the meetings are presented in a draft report. The report uh, has been shared with city council in this afternoon. It goes to talk about and this was in 2016. So I'm looking at, there were two working groups within this, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm saying this, that I don't, I don't think it's a bad idea to put it to the citizens. I may not agree with the format, but when we get citizens inputs for like our Parks and Rec Master Plan, we have it at different locations across the city um, over the course of time. This was a heavily discussed conversation in 2016, in 2017, and we're back here 20, from 2020 to 2022. And so I would, if, if I could give a recommendation, my recommendation, because there is a motion on the floor, but my recommendation would be to follow the footprint that we, we, we use when we're gathering input from our citizens. We go to their community watch meetings. We go to the rec centers. We reserve space at our rec centers. Mr. Hewitt, is that not right? Is that correct? Is that what we do when we're gathering citizen input? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I, it would be it would be my recommendation that we do that. Uh, really go to where these people are every single day. We also talked about. Um, in our working com uh, committees being at the grocery store. And we can, while we can't ask you all to do all that, but I think if we already have a footprint, and it here says here, six community meetings. I can guarantee you I can know exactly, I probably know exactly where those meetings were in 2016, 2017. So that would be my recommendation uh, to the Human Relations Commission. Um, and I will also reach out to the commissioners who went on these exact meetings to discuss the market house back then. Thank, thank you, Councilwoman. Before I go to Councilman Wright, just to clarify what she's talking about. It was to remove the seal from the image of the city, which we did that, and it was tough work to do it. It, it, it involved some robust conversation, and I think, like you said, to your point, uh, using the same strategy of, of engagement is probably a good thing, but 
2016, 2017, it was a seal up here, and the market house was on everything affiliated with the city. And today, there's there's not any attachment to the market house it, uh, with the city government. So you know, it was hard work, but commitment and the citizens doing it, uh, we got there. So I think we'll get there. Councilmember Wright, and then uh, we'll any more discussion on the motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We spent a lot of time, uh, effort, uh, staff hours researching. Um, looking into um, trying to come up with solutions as far as the three options that was presented to us. And I want to go back to the city ma uh, manager for a moment uh, because when you start, when you're talking about starting over, taking everything off the table and starting fresh, then we have to consider what we've already, you know, uh, put on the table, the time it took, the research, the information we had to get to where we are. I think the biggest thing that we're saying right now is that we certainly need more uh, citizens' input. But I want to ask the, uh, the city manager to go over briefly some of the things that you and the staff had to do uh, for us to come up with this, these options where, where we are right now as far as um, you know, the demolishing or the moving or repurposing. Uh, talk to the citizens about what it took to get there. Thank you, um, Councilmember Wright. Um, this has been a, um, a very difficult conversation for the council and the community for a number of months. Um, the council um, had multiple discussions where you voted several times that your interest was to not move the market house, not demolish the market house, and not leave the market house as it was. That was those were your options that you said we're not going to do. You were not going to leave it alone and let it be the status quo. You were not going to move it, and you were not going to demolish it. Consistent with that direction, the DOJ came in and used a tried and true community and, uh, engagement model. What we're hearing tonight from the council, and I think we're all hearing it very clearly, that in a time of COVID and possibly even just the process, um, we needed more community input than we received. But again, the council had already done what they thought was the heavy lift by saying, we're not going to demolish it, we're not going to move it, and we're not going to allow it to stay the status quo. Can you, can you uh, talk about the prices? Yes, sir. Move? And so if you look actually, I'm, I'm coming, sir, really quickly. But you, if you take a look at the report that they actually prepared, um, and you look at the recommendations that the working group put together, you will see that they, there were some competing voices. There were times in the earlier meeting where there were conversations very similar to what you're having now, but they worked through it. But specifically to your question, there were questions um, that we worked through about whether the market house could even be moved safely. And then there were questions about if it could be moved, how much would it cost to move it and where? And at the end of the day, um, some of the conversations that you may recall would, were that whether the market house stands where it is now or not, it will still always be the place where um, people were sold um, into slavery. And so there was a lot of history around that. But the council at the time took the heavy lift. Um, and based upon that, the conversation really was around what were some opportunities for us to show a greater um, history of the site, embrace um, the history painful as it may be, but also look and set the stage for the further conversations, which I think they are prepared to have if council's willing, which is, what do you do next? All right. All right, council, uh, as we have a motion on the floor, it's a motion by council member Banks McLaughlin, uh, which I'll get her to restate that. I know we've had a lot of discussion. It was seconded by council member Kinston uh, as we look for discussion uh, on this motion, and then we'll we'll move forward after that. So, Councilmember Banks McLaughlin, please restate your ask again. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to amend it. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I am um, making a motion to allow the residents, more residents, to come in. Rather, um, we go ahead. I'll let staff figure out as far as uh, putting together multiple um, different locations to have more input, and I, it should be open to everybody not handpicked everybody and allow them to come in and have input 
Board, Mr. Mayor, that, that was not her motion. That's not the motion on the floor. She said she was. So I are just, you amending it? I just, I said I would like to amend it. Okay. All right. I said that. Okay. So uh, the amended motion is to remit this back to staff uh, for more citizen engagement, correct? To open it to the yeah, entire. Yes. And, but I just wanted to be clear about that, not handpicked. Open it up to the Sure. Entire, and, and whatever whatever public. process we, we need, we need to make sure it's representative and, of its many. And for this to come back um, no later than July. Okay. All right. Is Sorry that? Did you accept the amendment, uh, Councilman McKenzie? Yes, sir. Um, All right. That is a, a an amended motion, so I'll, I'll give another uh, discussion phase if need be. Councilmember Ingram. Thank you. I, I, since we are on the discussion of the market house, I was going to ask for a friendly amendment to include uh, giving direction to staff to remove the fence around the market house. Well, I think that was going to, which there was a conversation set for this item coming up with that. Today? Uh, yeah. Okay. And as soon as we finish with DOJ. All right, so the motion on the floor, uh, as stated, any other discussion on that motion, which is to send this back to staff uh, and to come back within specified time uh, with the process of executing a community-wide discussion uh, and to make sure that, that the table is expanded for uh, as many citizens to participate as possible. All right, discussion? Okay. Hit your buttons for me, guys. Sorry about I, I got you. Okay, so my question is, um, for the community engagement, are we going to have the DOJ here with us, or are we going to have, is it going to be the Human Re Relations Commission um, spearheading that, or is that staff spearheading that? So, Dan, is that, a, is that, was your work set to end tonight, or would you, you all still be a neutral facilitator as you work with the staff to figure out how to, how to reach the community a little deeper? We are willing to come back and assist in any way that, uh, that we can. We don't have a, a set program that will allow, uh, will allow the, the mass numbers that I think the councilwoman is seeking unfiltered. However, I'd be willing to help facilitate if there is a program that, that you'd like me to help you with. Okay. So, uh, and and I just have a few questions, and I apologize. So will they be discussing whether it is demolished, whether it is moved, or whether it is repurposed? Is that what we're looking for? She amended her motion to remit it back for community discussion, so. On those three things, or on? Originally, the motion was to wipe the slate clean, if I understood it right. Right. And then she amended it to specifically remit it back. So um, the motion on the floor, as you as it relates to this vote, it, this is a question for that. So it, it was not included in what was said. That was the amended part of it. So unless it's added, uh, then okay. So I just want to make sure that you know there is clear direction because that is a lot to hold if we open it up to the public, and that's a lot of water to carry for the Human Relations um, Commission to do. So um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that y'all are um, available. So th those are just my questions and thank you. All right, uh, so let me go to Councilmember Dawkins. He hasn't spoken and then uh, I'll go to Wright and then Council will try to see if we can get to uh, disposal of this motion either for or against. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I encourage a vote against this motion these folks have been spending many hours, hundreds of hours. They, they've engaged a lot of people. This is just the beginning of the process. So to think that we're just going to base a decision now on what they brought, it's not going to happen. They've got many, many hundreds of hours to still go. I recommend a vote against this motion to let these fine folks I mean, these are smart people. The DOJ, the HRC, these are folks that have spent many hours and had to be involved in negotiating and calming communities. I mean, that's what that gentleman does. And he, he, he was successful in the Army as a Judge Advocate General, and he's been very successful at DOJ. I say we let him continue with, with what he's doing, and then after that's done, if, if we're still not happy, if we still believe the folks have not had enough input, then we'll continue that process. But to throw out what they have worked so hard to do 
is is I, I encourage a vote against it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, well, Councilman, I, I didn't get that out of the motion. I think the motion uh, was to send it back to them, which DOJ said that you're still willing to, to work with. Mr. HR. Mayor, um, point of order. What I'm suggesting is we let them finish their process. This is just the part one of their process. There is a whole nother part two of their process. And then if we are still not happy, then let's go and open it up and figure out what our next steps are. But Mr. Lyons, just make sure I'm clear. I didn't hear this was part one of three or one of two. Is this? So it's not exactly uh, part one and part two. What it is is we've, we've, we've narrowed down the community's input into a set of, a set of action plans and, and recommendations for city council. What we will do at this point going forward, the second half, is at this point, instead of having the full body come back together, the full 80 or so people who weighed in, and by the way, uh, they were from various and diverse organizations within the community, including the NAACP and several people and several organizations who opposed the market houses um, realization at all. That was one of the issues that we had to overcome. Uh, but however, instead of reconvening all 80 or more citizens who participated, we would now go forward with the recommendations that we have and a, a, a sub commission, a sub committee of those same 80 people now represented by five from the first group in October and five from the second group in January. Those, were, those would be the people on a committee now tasked to work with the city council to implement the plans that they came up with. Okay, so the clarity is, and I think the difference between the motion on the floor and what you just described is you using who you've already spoken to as the base of right, people to execute the recommendations whereas this motion remits it back and says expand it and open it up to the community. So, Correct. We, we would not go back so, to uh, getting, getting new input. It's now taking the input that we have and refining it into actual working orders. So, yeah. right. So, it, it so there are two, there are two different conversations that are taking place. The motion says it will go back, expand it, didn't have all the details as to what expansion looked like. So, Mr. Lyons, just before we go to the next council member, I did want to ask you what the concerns you've heard tonight with expanding the number of people who are at the table. Are you able to do that same process again and then to take the, the recommendations from both groups? If you, if you took another, if you left the research and the time that you have in the 80 plus people that you just spoke of, yes, sir. could you do that again with a different 80 group that maybe? We was can, selected in a different way. We can redo this process as many times as as needed, okay. or even even even. So I don't think the research is bad. I don't think the information you have is 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 gone to waste. Uh, I mean, that's eighty members representing a lot of different groups, according to what you all said that that are part of the process. But that's just saying that there's there's more that you could get to, but. Yes, I think you've answered my question with the fact that you, you, you guys could replicate the process and expand the base of people, is what you're saying. All right, I got a council member, uh, Wright and then Ingram. Okay, the first thing I want to say is we're not going to make everybody happy in this process. At the end of the day, regardless of what decision we make, uh, there's going to be a group that's not going to be happy. So as a city, as a city council, uh, we realize that, but I think as long as we do our due diligence, and I agree with you know sending it back and getting a larger scale. But my question for clarity is this: We send it back, um, and the way the motion went, and you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, the way I understand it, uh, we're sending it back to get input. Uh, from, more people. From, from more people, uh, and that input would be on those same three, uh, uh, you know, uh, five aspects. 
aspects that you've already worked on before. So I think that that's what we want to get more input, but how we get that input and how it would be effective. And so if we go back with 80 people, then another 80, and then another 80, we're, we're another year and a half down the line, I would suggest um, uh, uh, um, maybe a friendly amendment or this would be something that coming back is that now we probably have to hire an agency that has the equipment, that has the ability to, to send out information on a mass scale to get input and send that back to you guys to kind of decipher that to say that we have heard from a vast majority of diverse people in the community that has different feelings about it. And so I think we need to do that. So there's going to be some more money involved uh, with trying to get to the solutions because 80 and 88, that's not going to do it because you're dealing with over 200,000 people with a, with, with, that has a, a view. There's going to come, somebody's going to come back and says, I don't, I don't agree with nothing y'all said. Let's start over again. So let's try to prevent that out of the gate. And I think we're going in the right direction. And from what I'm hearing from the majority of the council, that we, we want to get more input. But I wanted to say finally, Mr. Mayor, that I think you guys have done a fine job with what you're doing and how you're doing it. But I think the problem is the council don't know what you're doing. And so when you came back to us to, to present it to us today, we have all of these questions that I think you probably should have sent us something. Did you send us something ahead of time, emails to all? Uh, you didn't, how, how does that work? I, I did not. I did not uh, contact the council directly. I submitted the report that was approved by the Department of Justice to the HRC, and uh, the HRC distributed it. Okay. Well, you know, transparency is what we want, and so this is how we get transparency, so everybody know the process, and so I appreciate that, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, uh, go to Councilman Davis, but Council, remember, uh, at, at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to talk to 208,000 people, okay? Um, even when elections happen, 10, 15, 20% of the people make a decision, and, and all the time, they're not on the same page with that. So it's a tough decision that the body, whatever elected body that is, is gonna have to make about that property that the city owns. Uh, and so we can try to get to as many opinions as we can, but if you're setting 208,000 as the goal, that's, that's, that's not realistic. So um, just, just remember that even with a referendum, if 10 or 20 or 30% of the turnout showed up, that's still that amount of people making the decision for 70% of the, of the population or better. So um, I'm gonna go to Councilmember Davis. Uh, did you withdraw yours, sir? Absolutely, Your name, your name Mayor, disappeared. All right, I'm gonna go back to Councilmember uh, Ingram and then Banks McLaughlin and Kinston, the two motion makers I hope are there to restate that and let's take a vote, guys, we gotta move this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I did want to um, highlight that we did re we did visit the option about purchasing surveys, e surveys and we, we, we decided against that as a body. But I also want to ask, before they make the, their, their motion, you mentioned that we it would come up later about the market as house as fits. So, okay, so I will be prepared to make that motion directly after, but I'd like to call for the vote. All right. All right, discussion's ended. Uh, those in uh, restate the motion just for the record, which is to remit it back to staff. Uh, Councilmember Banks McLaughlin, correct? The 50th million. That's right. It's, uh, Jesus. Just to make sure it's yes, clear. I'm, I'm making a motion so that it can go back to our staff to open it up so that there can be more interaction, more people to have input, not handpicked, allow the residents to come in and. Got it. All right. Those in, those in favor, your votes are on the screen, guys. Uh, should be on vote. All right, we'll go back to hands. Those in favor of the motion to send us back to staff to work with uh, HRC and, and DOJ and expand to the citizen, uh, more citizens. All right, uh, those voting for Councilman Davis, uh, Ingram, Jones, Wright, Colvin, Jensen, Hare, uh, Banks McLaughlin and Kinston, those voting opposition, Councilman Dawkins. Motion carries nine to one. All right. And now, uh, thank you, Mr. Lyons. Thank y'all for the work, you know, and uh, we appreciate a very large first step, but we just got a little, little bit more to go. 
All right, so council, um, as, uh, as we discussed, there was a um, uh, conversation that uh, the manager had that he was bringing for some direction uh, regarding uh, the construction uh, barrier that is around the market house. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Manager, did you want to update us on uh, the condition of uh, or the status of the construction and the, and the barricade that is there? Well, Mayor, um, staff is um, awaiting council's um, pleasure uh, about the uh, fencing around the market house. The repairs have been completed, and um, we're just waiting direction from council as to what you'd like to do next. If council does make a decision to do something uh, with the fencing, staff, of course, will be happy to come back with options for council to consider about how to um, uh, make sure that um, our reopening of the uh, square or the area under the market house is done in such a way that is um, not detrimental um, to uh, to the planned reopening. But again, we just await council's um, direction. All right, uh, council member Kent, is this, are these questions? Because uh, I'll take the motion after question, so I do have three that popped up for questions. It's a question. It is a question. Council member Kiss. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Do we need to add that to the agenda? No. To be um, two thirds vote to add it to the agenda since it's not listed, or is that no? no it was it's still under the report for right. market house repurposing, which is a part of implementation. I think, city attorney. Okay, um, so can I go ahead and ask my second question now? Yes, ma'am. So my second question, um, you had sent out a um, like a screen print to what the fencing could look like. Um, my concern was the thought of the screen print. Um, one would be the cost of it, and two, is that a temporary screen print? So once you take that down, um, is that the end of it? Yeah, so the thought process in that was, I, I know as the discussions were taking place about the condition of defense, and not, notwithstanding the conversation that we just heard, because I didn't know where that was going about, that we're still in the process of seeing what the ultimate result was. If you, I sent examples of, of places where uh, graphics or better looking fencing is, is available. You know, you see it in, in a lot of the cities where they're under construction of apartments or high rise and it has the image of what's to come right there along with some information. So I do agree that what's there is not uh, appealing uh, cosmetically and there's some areas that have been torn, I guess. Um, but I, I think we can get into that. That was just something for the council to consider. Uh, as we talk through the conversation, I think the biggest decision will be uh, whether what's there is removed uh, completely, or whether something else is is done uh, with the with the understanding of where we're going long term. So um, that was what that was for for consideration about about graphics being embedded into the into the temporary fencing. I guess was. Yes. I, okay. Thank you, Mayor. Because I do have a concern with paying for graph temporary graphics to go around the market house again when it should just be a decision to either leave it leave the fence or take the fence down. I think it's unnecessary for us to uh, spend any additional money for cosmetic use. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jensen. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I guess I know, um, Council Member Ingram, I know what you are wanting to do. And I don't disagree. But what I will say is that it took us you know, we just, the fence just did not come up. If we take the fence down tomorrow, I don't know if we are prepared for it. I don't know, but I would like to see that we send it back to the city manager to come back with a plan for 30 days and um, of taking down the fence. Because if we just take it down, you know, there is work that probably needs to be done. We just, I, I just think we need to have a plan. All right. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Jennifer, I lost. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Wright. Uh, Councilmember Ingram, yours was a motion or a question? I can go last from the okay. motion. Okay. Councilmember Wright, and then here. I've given it uh, a lot of thought with the market house, um, and we are in this dilemma um, as our previous discussion. Um, but you know, when I, when I think about the market house, it's the center of the city, but it's very controversial. And a lot of people, you know, want to be able to enjoy the market house, to be able to 
um, you know, shop and do all the things that they do downtown and, and, and appreciate the, you know, the structure of the historical building. Um, but then it, it's also a place of protest, a place that where you can go and send a message to, you know, the rest of the city and the rest of the world. Um, my, my question would be, um, once we take, once we take it down, um, for those that are concerned about the future of the market house, and that's what we're talking about now, for those that are concerned about how we go forward with an image that, you know, that is controversial, uh, and if our hearts are in it, how do we use the market house at this point, knowing that we're in a, a situation to try to make it a better place for everybody. Um, if we take, when we take it down, aesthetically, and I agree, if you put money into it, if it's temporary, are we, are we losing money? But I don't think we'll be able to control the community as to what they want to do. But my question would be to um, the city manager or to the uh, city attorney, um, the market house is city property, is that correct? Yes, sir. And so, as, as being a part of city property, is, is there anything that we or the city can do as far as um, limitations or policies pertaining to the public domain uh, that we could have some type of guidelines when it comes to um, the market house? Yes, sir. Um, there are some things that we can do. Um, we would probably need some time to be very thoughtful about that and research it. Right. Um, uh, some of the ones that come to mind immediately would be um, the uh, time at which people could be able to use that park um, and uh, what would be appropriate uses and what wouldn't be appropriate uses. But of course, the city attorney would have to um, give us guidance on um, things like um, First Amendment rights and other right. things like that that we right. need to consider. Absolutely. I would love to get um, information uh, and see legally, you know, um, we just don't want it to be um, a place of controversy um, because of the climate that we're, we're in. And so that's, that's my concern. And I, I, you know, I believe in free speech. I believe in protests. I believe in all of that. But uh, as we go forward trying to make our city more conducive and balance and equality, I think we need to consider and think about all of those things going forward. All right, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member uh, Heron Jones. <laughs> The work is done. Um, all the repairs have been done. Correct? Yes, sir. And we can't always prohibit people from wanting to uh, use the market house as a protest area or any location in in our city we've done the we've done the work and we we are having open dialogue on how to deal with it with the citizens of Fayetteville and we're trying to hear back from them because it is a sticky sticky subject it's been a sticky subject ever since I've been on council and I don't uh, and until we get some changes uh, it probably always will be but um, I just don't see where we where the need to continue to have it um, surrounded with a temporary fence with all of the work has been done the improvements have been done and the fence doesn't make it look any better and so that's just where I that's where I feel that's what I feel that's where I stand as far as um, us we need to move forward with opening it up back up Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to say this. If, if we're really a community that's trying to heal and trying to work through some issues, I think we're, we're, we're past the point of it being a controversy. We, we just 
discuss that. So I think the fence is, is related, but I think is really somewhat separate in the sense of going back to my original point. If, the, if we're trying to heal that fence, to me, to me, is somewhat symbolic of it's still divisive. And um, there's never truly going to be a right time as far as this is the right time to remove it. This is the right time to remove it. And I say this uh, from the depths of my heart, what I'm getting ready to say. At some point, we have to trust a community to do the right thing just like some would trust them to do the wrong thing. And that's all I'm saying. At, at some point, you have to turn that curve and say, if it's, for lack of a better word, if it's, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, so be it. But the point is, there are things in place if something goes awry. I know we're not speaking it, but there's things there. But at some point, I think you still have to say, okay, I, I'm going to trust the community to do the right thing. Just like, again, some would trust them to do the wrong thing. So I, that's just... That's just how I stand right now. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, real quick before I go to Council Member Ingram, Mr. Manager, if uh, what is the logistical process of uh, removal? How does that look uh, from your point of view? Well, um, we would probably want to make sure we gave notice um, so that um, we had um, made everyone aware, and probably uh, several days for that. Um, we would need to remove the fencing, clean up, uh, probably brush and um, sweep the area. Um, I would like some time to be able to consult with the city attorney on um, what would be some times um, and um, simple um, guidelines that we could put in place or that could have the council consider before we um, open it up. I think it was, I um, can't remember which council member said it. As you'll recall, we didn't put the fence up immediately. Um, we um, um, had several instances where things occurred and it just became very problematic and it actually became very dangerous because of the ongoing need to make the repairs. And in that same vein, it would be nice to take some time to be very thoughtful, but not too much time if that's council's interest. And so would again, would respect what well, we asked probably for several weeks um, or um, about that um, two weeks or so or a month to be able to come back and um, unroll it. But it's council's decision. We can do it as soon or as, uh, as you'd like. All right, thank you. Council Member Ingram. Thank you, I have a few questions. And I, um, as the district two representative where the market house is located, I get a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails about the fence coming down. And uh, I, I do agree the fence needs to come down and I've asked council uh, to remove the fence on four different occasions, but I do have a few questions before I make um, my motion, Mr. Manager. Um, well, what type of guidelines do you perceive being put in place? Because from my understanding, we put policy in place. We put um, an ordinance that stated there could not be any encampments at the market house. Is that correct? But there can be free free speech at the market house, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So as we're moving forward, I can't I can't recognize, I can't I can't foresee what other type of guidelines that there would be for there to be in place at a public property. Also, I go back to what the market house what market house what I envisioned at the market house before all this happened. <laughs> The market house was a meeting spot where people would meet up to go to lunch together. People would sit and com conversate with each other. People would honor the, the history of it, whatever that history was. A lot of times I would hear people talk about the history of slaves being human beings, black people being sold there. But I really want to envision what other guidelines can be put in place because anything before anything past what we already have in place, I just don't think that's, that's, that's of democracy. To me, it's not. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna ask, that, ask that and then I'll make my motion. So can you please give me some understanding? 
Well, that's what we would um, want to have some time to be thoughtful about. But it's up to council to describe um, and dictate the timing for the removal, if that's council's wish. And staff, of course, will follow. Okay, oh, I'd I, like to make I, a... Uh, one more question. Councilman Wright, real quick, and then we need this motion. Yeah, I think the, the city... Okay. Just turn your mic off. What did you say? Just turn your mic off, sir. I think that the, uh, the city manager just answered the question that she asked because you have to be careful not to infringe on the rights of people in free speech. Um, that's something that we certainly don't want to do. Um, and so the city manager answered that. And then if there's anything else, fine, he'll bring it back. If not, then that's fine because we certainly want the market house to be a place uh, that will be the image um, of the city that everybody can appreciate. And so uh, I concur. Oh, All right, Council Member uh, Ingram, please. I'd like to make a motion to uh, direct staff to remove the market house as soon as they can prepare to remove it. I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> y'all was ready for that one. <laughs> Please don't get that spectrum. Uh, <laughs> as I like to restate, please forgive me. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to direct staff to remove the fence around the market house as soon as staff can prepare to do so. All right, there's a motion by Councilmember Ingram uh, as stated. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Dawkins. All right. Oh. All right, any discussion on the motion, on the Dawkins Ingram motion? <laughs> All right. All right, seeing none, uh, council will look to you for your vote uh, to move forward with that. All right, those voting in favor, show of hands. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Council. Yeah, we'll just go do it old-fashioned way. Councilman Davis, unanimous. Ingram, Dawkins, Jones, Wright, Colvin, Jensen, Hare, and Kinston, those voting opposition. Councilmember Banks McLaughlin, motion carries nine to one. Uh, good job, you all. All right. All right, Council, moving forward to item 8.02, uh, Juneteenth update. I think we've talked extensively to the Juneteenth crew, but uh, I see Ms. Shoneman and uh, I think Circa and some of the others are coming forward to talk to us. Good evening. Good evening. How are you guys? Good. We're excited to see all the progress tonight. Uh, we do have a presentation. I don't know if we are having some technical difficulties. Uh, Jennifer, maybe you could help me here. Uh, Council Chambers looks fantastic, by the way. It's really nice to be back here tonight. Yes, it is. You'll see more. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Bianca Shoneman. I work for the Cool Spring Downtown District. It's a pleasure to introduce my team, Ashanti Bennett, Director of Special Projects, Lauren Falls, Director of Events and Branding, and of course, Terrell Walker, who works with Circa 1865 and who is a deep partner with us on this event. Uh, you guys have contracted with us to bring forth the city's first ever city sponsor Juneteenth event in the core of our city. We've had a really fun time sort of going through what your interests are and getting to some good deliverables. And so tonight, we're going to give you a brief update. We're going to go quick because it's been a long night and I am muy dormado. All right, so my main objective with partnering with Circa 1865 is that they have a long standing history of curating Juneteenth events within the county. And so we felt like it was relevant to bring them on from the onset of this. So what you'll see tonight is a presentation focused on what's happening in the heart of the city. Know that though simultaneously beginning on Thursday, is that the 16th, Terrell? On the 16th, what we'll be doing is we'll be launching a countywide celebration throughout the county, and we will bring forward a, a collaborative endeavor that looks at multiple cities within Cumberland County and then uh, ultimately culminates here in the heart of our uh, county in downtown Fayetteville. So again, a collaborative countywide celebration bringing this federal holiday to its forefront. Ashanti, can you take it from here? Sure. Um, so not too much has changed in iteration since the last time that we spoke before council. We are still moving forth with a Juneteenth Jubilee on the 18th and the 19th. 
Uh, our Saturday programming will take place on Franklin Street, primarily with the side streets of Donaldson and Maxwell um, as specific areas, such as our Jubilee Eats, which will have our food trucks, wineries, breweries, um, and we will have the sponsors that will go up and down our Excuse me, allergy medication is definitely worn off at this point, um, as well as our nonprofits and those folks that will be on that particular street. We will also be having a run in the morning before the actual street festival opens up, as well as an opportunity for involving our youth. Um, we are still working on some of the logistics on how to get it out, but we would love for our students from Cumberland County Public Schools to be able to do this art project that would then be displayed during the festival itself. Um, we will have on our Maxwell Street an auxiliary stage that will incorporate some of the local uh, acts that we have here and be able to highlight some of the talent that we have right here in our backyard, as well as our actual artists and artists in row. We will also be uh, incorporating a public art project that allows our public to speak about what Juneteenth means to them uh, with a chalk wall, um, perhaps multiple chalk walls that would then be able to be displayed after the event is over. Um, our main stage, which will be located at the top of Franklin Street at the corner of Franklin and Gillespie with national touring acts opening up that day with prayer and working with our local choirs to end it with a rousing rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing along with the uh, fireworks display. Phew, excuse me. On Sunday, we will be having a heritage brunch. Um, we will be featuring Southern Cuisine from the area and um, light musical entertainment, as well as we have recently secured our ninth North Carolina Poet Laureate, Jackie Shelton Green, to deliver a keynote address at that particular time. Personally, very, very excited for that. <laughs> Um, and then we have some additional programming on Sunday. And then so at Festival Park on Sunday, we have a very large scale event that's being curated by Cumulus Media in partnership with this initiative. It's called Praise in the Park. They'll have um, African drums, dance, gospel, choir, uh, vendors, and an MLK presentation, food trucks. There'll be a community mural project. And most importantly, they also will have a national headliner. And then again, Terrell, you've got some really good things happening throughout the county. I just want to be mindful of time, but do you want to quickly touch on those? Yeah, sure. So uh, the big four-day celebration will include downtown Fayetteville, obviously, for Saturday and Sunday. Prior to that, uh, we have Thursday. We'll be launching our launch party at Dirtbag Ales in Hope Mills. Um, Friday morning, we'll be doing a golf tournament, Freedom on the Fairway, which is at Stryker on Fort Bragg. That's how we bring them into it. Uh, and then Friday night, uh, we will have our first after party called The Extra after party, uh, similar to a Met Gala, it's our time to dress to impress. Whatever extra is to you, bring it out. Uh, we're looking at the ambassador being, well, I'll leave that. But when you hear this person, you will say, oh, that makes sense. Um, so that's the extra after party. Saturday, we'll be downtown with the wonderful team of Cool Spring in Fayetteville. Uh, and then Saturday night, we'll also be adding another after party at End Zone on Riley Road, where our celebrity will hopefully do a walkthrough. And then we'll continue with the team. Okay, and so Lauren, um, as you guys might remember, had asked her to combine the two flags. Lauren, this is your area. She's the artist in-house, so just give a brief overview of this beautiful poster. <laughs> Thank you, Bianca. So upon the guidance from the last city council meeting, the, it was upon the council's guidance that they would like to see a blending of not only the Juneteenth flag, but also the Pan-African flag. Just to do a brief overview of what research went into this project, whenever I'm given an assignment, I like to do a lot of research on it. So one thing that I wanted to do is how do we blend those two flags together? And as you know, the power fist is a very symbolic symbol in our community, so I thought what the greatest way to do is place a Pan-African flag behind the fist, as well as incorporating the Juneteenth flag in the overall layout of the poster. And if you see, you can see both of those elements combined in what I would say a successful design. <laughs> <laughs> From an artist's perspective, um, the five colors aren't necessarily on the color wheel together. I learned this in this process, so I, I feel like she should get a round of applause because it looks pretty darn good. <laughs> Great job, Lauren. Um, as you guys know, we're looking to host this as a street festival on Franklin Street and then um, Donaldson and Maxwell Street using our side streets as sort of auxiliary fun points. 
it's going to be beautiful. We're looking to drape the existing street poles with the colors that we have looked to embrace, which is all five colors found in the two flags. Uh, we're really excited about the progress. We're this close to signing contracts, but we wanted to make sure we had money in hand tonight, so we have not executed any contracts. You'll likely be getting an update on this maiden stages. I will say there's some great local talent, really great local talent potentially involved, and some broader, um, you know, like Vogue-like stuff. We don't know yet, do we, Terrell? We're just, we're still contracting here. So talking, we're in talks, lots of talks. Okay, and so our partners at this point include, uh, you guys, obviously the biggest partners of them all, uh, the Fayetteville Press, the Fayetteville Running Club, circa 1860. Metro Nut has signed on as a corporate partner, Cumulus Media, of course. Healy Wholesale is investing in us, and I'm pleased to say that our own downtown academy, the Capital Encore Academy, has already cut us a check, too. So if you're interested as a corporation in joining us, we'd love to have you and um, are looking to implement a budget request tonight for $145,000 to bring forth this wonderful federal holiday as the first city-sponsored event. Thank you. All right. Uh, <laughs> There's a, there's a lot of work. I know you, you guys uh, have been moving uh, very fast to, to kind of meet the deadline uh, of Juneteenth. I know the council, you've checked in with us several times. I have to give you kudos on the colors. We've, we've come a long way, so that was a great job. I wasn't sure how all those colors would fit together, but you pulled it off. So uh, look forward to it. So, council, the, the, the ask tonight is as we were briefed in our work session uh, to allocate, uh, appropriate this, the budget request of 145 uh, so that they can uh, continue moving and planning for uh, this historic inaugural event in downtown. So, Councilman Wright. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I really like uh, the flag, the colors. You guys done a great job with that. I want to make a motion. Oh, to move. Well. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. I thought we oh. was operating by our systems. Yeah. Yeah. I, I put it in my system. Yeah, uh, I'll come back to you on the, on the motion, sir. Uh, I have Council Member Ingram and then Mayor Pro Tem Jensen and Kinston. Yeah, thank you. I'll go last and I oh. will be made. Thank you. All right. You, okay. All right. Let me let me move to uh, Mayor Pro Tem. So Jensen. great job. One quick question: Have y'all gotten in touch with the Fateville Cumberland Youth Council? Are they part of? Um, I, I don't think we have made contact with them, but uh, thank you for that suggestion. We will certainly reach okay, out to Crystal. Okay, and if I can help in any way, please let me know. But Absolutely. great job. I'm very excited, and I'm ready for the Met Gala. <laughs> All right, you, and you, you are working with the Divine Nine, I think, right? Yes, correct. Okay, I'm good. sorry, I forgot to put them on the list. Those were uh, cash contributing partners. Okay, good, good. Well, All right, Divine Nine, way to go. All right, uh, Councilmember Kinston. Not them. Huh? <laughs> Not them. Oh. All right. Uh, maybe that's an encouragement. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, Councilmember Kinston. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Now, Bianca, you know the same question I'm going to ask. I do. Okay. We don't have the answer yet. <laughs> but as soon as we pull together the brunch committee, we will certainly call you, okay? I promise yeah. we know to make it very accessible, and we know that it is in your interest to ensure that there's various oh, levels of price points, and we are cognizant of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, Councilmember Ingram. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Along, uh, aligned with uh, uh, the com comments by uh, Councilmember Jensen, um, which I also noticed in the DOJ um, uh, report was left out, the Millennial Commission, um, making sure there's input from them or you know some assistance from them. I know they they tend to like to step up. Um, so also. Um, as, as far as partners, I saw you had the Friend Federal Running Club, but I also like to uplift the uh, Black Girls Black, Black Girls Running Club and also Black Men Run. They they are very very in tune with community happenings, and I know they would love. They are also a part of Federal Running Club, but also just like to uplift them. And with that, I like to make a motion. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, Lauren for hearing us and our concerns when it came that come, come, came down to this. I really appreciate it. And thank you all of you for listening to us. And um, thank you council for trusting them to, to stick it through to do this. Um, with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve the, the concept and report and like to direct staff to appropriate 145,000 for the Juneteenth Jubilee Freedom Festival. All right, it's a motion by uh, Councilmember Ingram, seconded by Councilmember Wright. Any discussion on the motion? 
All right, Council, I look to you for your votes. Those in favor, show of hands. Uh, those in favor, Councilman Davis. Oh, unanimous looks like Councilman Davis, Ingram, yeah, Dawkins, Jones, Colvin, Wright, Jensen, Hare, uh, Banks, McLaughlin, and Kenston. Motion carries uh, unanimous. Madam Clerk, thank you. Good job, guys. The other graphics look great, too. All right. All right, Council, moving to our public hearing. This is a time that go individual. This is a time individual uh, may have input and a voice in what goes on in their city. Due to policy restrictions, the forum will not last any longer than 30 minutes, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the city council issues related to the city of Fayetteville. Individuals wishing to speak at tonight's public forum should have signed up with the city clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. If you're here to speak on items that may be on tonight's agenda under public hearing, we ask that you please reserve your comments until the public hearing. So when your name is called by the city clerk, ask that you please come to the podium. Clearly state your name and address for the record. Then when you see the light located on the podium change from green to yellow, you have 30 seconds left to speak. And when uh, you're notified that your time has expired, you'll be notified and your time will be expired. Again, due to policy restrictions, we're not able to extend a given time. With that being said, um, Mr. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, the first public hearing we have tonight is a, a request for a text amendment. This was submitted by the applicant Next Chapter Holdings. They're being represented by Mr. Jonathan Charleston. Um, and what they're looking to do is they have submitted a text amendment proposal to allow multiple single family detached dwellings on one lot. Um, the concept of this um, design has units. Uh, it looks very similar to a, a regular single family subdivision, although all the homes are on one lot. They're all owned by one owner and they're all used as rental properties. Um, this is something that seems to be catching on around the country. Um, and this is actually the third group that we've had come to Fayetteville with interest in doing this. This is just the first time that someone has decided to take the extra step and try to get our ordinance changed to allow this. Total that the street facing garage door or carport should not exceed 40% of the facade of the, the home. Uh, roof projections at all um, roof vents, antennas, satellite dishes, things that are on top of the roof would be located toward the back of the home so that they're not as visible from the street. Um, accessory structures uh, such as clubhouses, pools, the mail kiosk, other things like that would obviously be allowed. Um, that all of the internal streets would meet the city's uh, public or private street standards. And this is just a, this is the city's typical uh, public private street standard, just so you can see what it is. Uh, and then finally would be changing the definition or actually adding a new definition for dwelling multi-unit single family detached on one lot. And it would be designed to provide flexible and consistent alternative development to conventional single family residential subdivision. Um, will allow for construction of multiple single family detached dwellings on an individual lot without requiring subdivision <coughs> of the individual parcels uh, for each dwelling. And the use would be subject to those standards that I just went through. And when you're looking at those standards that we came up with, those are basically with some minor tweaks to them, the same standards that if you were building a conventional subdivision in the city that you would have to do. Um, so you do have a couple of options tonight uh, when we're at the end of this that uh, either to adopt it as written, uh, to deny it, to adopt it with some revisions or to remand it back to staff. Uh, and at this point, uh, Mr. Mayor, that's all I have. If you hold any questions for staff till after the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. With that, we will open 
the public hearing. Madam Clerk, please call your first speaker. May we just have one speaker for this item, Mr. Jonathan Charleston? Mr. Charleston, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Council. Hey. How are you? Great new facility. Y'all makes you guys look great. Thank you, sir. So I'm, I'm here tonight on behalf of the applicant uh, next chapter. Um, and, and what we have tonight to uh, present to you is really what we call the new face of rental housing. It's called single family built for rent. Uh, essentially, the um, marketplace has now identified that there is a build to rent niche that is growing rapidly, as Mr. Harmon indicated, and su suggests some important emerging trends that cities around the country are now trying, starting to deal with. Simply put, instead of opting for a standard apartment, some renters incline toward more of a single family residential experience with the benefit of a professionally managed and amenitized community. In other words, these are single family detached homes, which are essentially no different from multifamily, except they're detached. There's one owner, property is not subdivided, and is typically investor owned. Uh, these rental uh, communities typically offer one, two, and three bedrooms, sometimes four bedroom attached or, or detached homes with upscale finishings, uh, private yards for each unity, for each unit, a step above what renters can get in an apartment building. Developers say, and the uh, data suggests, that renters of this type of product are stickier than typical apartment renters because they see that their rental home as more of a long-term decision. Now, uh, tenants at these kinds of developments span professional millennials move up families, life, life transition folks, people are going through divorces, empty nesters. Most renters are younger households, tired of apartments, but not ready or able to buy a home yet. In addition, there is significant demand from boomer households who are downsizing from own single family but don't want apartment living. Uh, this type of unit is also ideal for millennials that are just starting to to have their families. What I will say is that Freddie Mac, which is a part of the Federal Housing Administration, did a recent survey of renters uh, of those planning to rent their next home. Uh, in that survey, it indicated that 45% indicated that they prefer to move into a single family detached rental home. Why? Only 11% of apartment units are three plus bedroom homes. Over 65% of single-family homes have three or more bedrooms. Mr. Charleston, I think your time is elapsed, sir. Okay. All right, Madam Clerk, we have any other speakers? No, sir, we do not. All right. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll open it to any questions for uh, Mr. Harmon or Mr. Charleston. I did have a question for Mr. Harmon. Okay. Uh, it was 15 minutes. That a person got has to speak in uh, public hearing. Uh, did I read the public form or here? No, I thought it was. I thought it was. I thought yeah. it was fifteen minutes for public hearing. hearing. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I apologize. The speaker should have had fifteen minutes. Not okay. Three. All right. Right. No yeah, and they they don't have my hearing documentation. No, here. for just one speaker, it's fifteen. All right, Mr. Charleston, apologize. You, you can continue, sir. Can you, can you reset the clock to reflect the correct uh, time? The balance of the 12 minute time. I can't do that. I'll have to do yeah. it on my phone. So it, uh, yeah. <laughs> and now I'm going to take all 15. You only have 12. <laughs> <laughs> you have 11, 15. You have 11 and 59 seconds. But go ahead, sir. Okay. Let's see if I can get my groove back here. Madam Clerk, can you set that to uh, 11? I can't do that with this time. I'm going to do it on uh, my cell phone. Okay. Well, just uh, turn that one off so I don't get mixed up. 
I'll be very brief, Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity just to, to conclude here. Uh, what I will say is I have one of the representatives from uh, my client here tonight that's available to answer any questions that you have as well. But what I will say uh, tonight, just so you'll know a little bit about the project that we're proposing, is the sites uh, that said issue that we're going to deal with, that you're not dealing with tonight, you're just doing a tax amendment. But we're looking to do 238 units on about 50 acres of land. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier, this is the same concept, and I want you to think about it this way. This is no different than any multifamily development that this council has approved rezoning for. One exception, each unit is detached. That's it. Single family rental. Uh, and this is something, as uh, Mr. Harmon indicated to you, that's taken the country by storm, a lot of investment dollars being placed in these type of uh, units for the reasons that I stated before, that the, uh, the public is looking for opportunities like this. As Freddie Mac said, 45% uh, of renters in a survey indicated that they would prefer to move into a single family detached rental home. And the reason is only 11% of apartments are three plus bedroom units. Over 65% of single family rental homes have three or more bedrooms. That's the distinction. And single family homes offer other advantages that we all know about, uh, which include among other things, uh, security, uh, space, and the feeling of um, that you're living in a, a, a piece of property that you actually own. As I mentioned earlier, there's a demand for families to have homes with garages on property that they don't have to maintain. You don't get that in a, in a multifamily attached uh, concept. In this particular case, there would be covenants, restrictive covenants that would limit what happens. But one of the things that I will tell you that's really unique about this is you have a single family living, but it's managed just like it's multifamily. In other words, the yards are cut by the management company. All the maintenance on the facility is, is, is handled by the owner uh, of the property. The only thing that the, the, the folks that live there have to do, essentially, is to move in and pay rent. And, uh, and so they have the benefit of living like they're in single family, but they're treated almost like they're in a nice hotel. You know, somebody comes and takes care of all the stuff that you need to have taken care of. As I indicated, there will be um, restrictive covenants in, in the case of the project that we're doing, and, and most of the other projects around the country uh, have the same uh, amenities. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and as Mr. Harmon mentioned, that there, are all, there will be other types of amenities, swim, swimming pools, clubhouses, things of that nature. And so we, uh, on behalf of my client, Next Chapter, support the uh, recommendations made by staff. There was a lot of work that went in by staff, and I want to thank staff for it. This is a unique uh, process, uh, a unique project, uh, but we think that the, uh, this is what's going to happen increasingly around the country. Mr. Harmon, could you put that, uh, some of those photos up so that they, uh, is that possible? Yeah, I don't have the photos. All I've got is the. Okay, no worries. Why don't I do this, Mr. Mayor? I'm just going to hand out a couple of. Uh, we actually have that little video that's sure from. Okay. Oh, it's been a while. I forgot we even had that. Uh, you can give it to the clerk, Mr. Charles. He's going to do the overhead. These are citizens can see it. Okay. I don't want to take up too much time. I've got all I've got to do is click on that link, and it's gonna. As long as the folks in the back put this up for everyone.
Everyone dreams of coming home to a great neighborhood. In the past, it required the long-term commitment of buying a house, but not anymore. With Next Chapter Neighborhoods, you don't have to buy the American dream, you can rent it. Single family houses with picket fences on lamppost lined streets. Elegant homes thoughtfully designed with upscale appliances and great spaces for a family to live. In a real neighborhood with sidewalks, first class resort style amenities and places to gather with neighbors and friends and a friendly team of professionals on site to serve you. At Next Chapter Neighborhoods, we're building great neighborhoods for great neighbors. All the benefits of owning your own home with the convenience of renting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'll certainly answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Charleston. So, um, Mr. Harmon, I did have a... Uh, yeah, that's what we saw. Uh, did have a question. So, yes. current ordinance uh, in the UDO that's being upgraded, what was the minimum acreage? Uh, well, this, this isn't allowed at all in the current UDO. Okay. And so where did, where did the 10 acre minimum come from? Uh -uh. One, that was from staff. We looked at it and we wanted to make sure that it wasn't too small a piece of property that, you know, that your, your next door neighbor who has three acres decides to try to do something like that on it. But we didn't want it, you know, too big. We fit 10 acres, um, that gives you, I think we calculated out if it's in the MR5, somewhere around 100 lots. Um, and so that's just what we were looking at is, like I said, it, staff looked at it that way that we thought 10 acres was kind of a big enough piece of property to do a project properly like this on. Okay. Um, and I was just thinking that, you know, we have a, a housing shortage in the city. I'm sure these guys have done their homework about that. Uh, yeah. 10 to 20,000 people, I think, uh, uh, need uh, houses, the inventory is tight. Um, and so the question is, with those large tracks being the minimum, how many will actually benefit development within the city? There's quite a few lots that are 10 acres or more still left in the city. Okay. All right. Uh, Councilman, other questions for Mr. Harmon? I think we see Councilman Hare, Ingram, and Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Harmon, thank you. Uh, I want to go back to the the 10 acre the 10 acre lots. Yes. When we start looking at the 10 acre lots with what we just saw in the video, <clears throat> what quantity um, of units are, will be locked into the, the 10 acres? Uh, are we set up? Is that a part of the, the our um, UDO where it's set up on the quantity of units that can be it, if the starter it, lot if the, if the starter amount is to ten lots? Yeah, it will be based on the zoning district that it's in, and like I was saying uh, with the mayor's question, um, if it's ten acres, if it's in the MR five, and and the O and I and NC are about the same density too. The 10 acres would get you about 100 lots or 100 housing units on that piece of property. And are these considered zero lot lines since they are, they are well, detached? What's going to be the it's, distance? It's definitely zero lot line because there are no individual lots between the houses. Okay. okay. There, it's okay. one big piece of property with... It, it's a subdivision that's owned by one person. Right, right. And they use all of the rent, all of the homes as rentals. Okay. And my last question, explain to me what access strips are. Oh, so that's in the, uh, in the part with the, um, the, the, uh, 
uh, open space. And that's basically saying that um, so that when they develop these, so that the um, houses aren't all in one area and the open space all somewhere else. So this is green space? Green space, okay. yeah. This is okay. so that, that the houses actually either, um, either abut green space a certain percentage or that they have these little access ways for the people, you know, they'll have a small yard, but have a way to get to these open green spaces. Right. So my, my final question is, so I understand how we start, how you got us to the 10 acres. So in, in order to have this type of a development, you have to start at least, are you saying? Yes. At 10 acres. And that is what the, a part of what the tax amendment is. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, Councilmember Ingram and then Mayor Pro Tem and Councilmember Joan. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, I um, I do have a one question, but I am also prepared to make the motion, and I've notated that. Okay. Uh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> hot tonight, huh? All right. I'll circle back. Uh, Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jensen and Councilmember Kinston. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I have a few questions. Um, my iPad's getting ready to go dead, so I need you to kind of move um, <laughs> back the um, presentation a little bit. Okay. Well, so you... I want the part where it shows um, the out, the layout. Oh, okay. And remember, this is the layout for this one particular development uh, that uh, Mr. Charleston is representing tonight. But okay. this would be citywide and could be laid out in many different and, ways. And I think that's the point that I, I need my questions answered because what I'm seeing on my screen looks phenomenal. Um, you know, and if I'm not mistaken, I'm seeing that there are houses that start out at 862 square feet up to 1800 square feet in this, exactly. in this complex. Yep. And basically, this complex is kind of like an apartment complex, but it's just homes because people are just going to be renting. Exactly. And under a, um, it, it will be a private sector. Is that correct? Correct. Like Mr. Charleston said, you'll pay rent, You'll, but it's, it, it will function similar to an apartment. To, to an apartment, yes. So... The question that I have, and I, I completely agree with the, the mayor, we are in a housing shortage, and this looks like it'd be a great answer. But where my concern is on changing the ordinance, not the concern on what we're looking at in front of us, but changing the ordinance. Mm -hmm. You had said that for every 10 acres, you can get 100 homes on. Approximately, yes. So what I'm looking <laughs> at right now is 50 acres. Yes. And it has 233 units on it. Correct. This looks great. Yeah. I can support that all day long. But what we're talking about, if the minimum is 10 acres, we're going to put, so you can have 20 acres and put this facility on it you possibly could and that yeah. is not even half of this so but, but if you had 20 acres you could also put that same density into an apartment or something as well no i i that's, fully understand yeah. i fully understand but that's kind of the question is in front of us we're seeing 233 units on 50 acres but if we change the ordinance to 10 acres, you can fit that same exact amount on 20 acres. You, in theory, at least you could. Okay. So then the next question is, um, I did see the zoning. And again, I'm sorry, my iPad went yes. um, kaput. So with that being said, if you are in a neighborhood 
and let's say that the neighborhood has, you know, they started out the first part and then it expands to the second part and then it expands to the third part. If there are is 10 acres back there, if there is 10 acres back there, can they go into that neighborhood and put, quote unquote, a glorified if, apartment if complex? If, if it's zoned correctly, then yes. Just, just like today, if that 10 acres in the back of this development were zoned MR5, mm -hmm. someone could purchase it, put up apartments, it would never come to city council. Okay. It, it would meet the zoning district. So it, let's say there's a neighborhood and it's um, SF10. They would have to come back to count, council Correct. to get it rezoned to MR5. Correct. Or... Um, or one of these or one of the other two that I, it's my iPad I can't remember okay all right I think my questions have been answered thank you thank you Mayor Pro Tim Councilmember Kinston yes thank you Mayor Mr. Harmon I just have two questions one of the questions I have is um, if approved tonight are all the units going to be built at one time or is this going to be done in stages do you have that that, that is a question for Mr. Charleston and his client um, on how they plan to to stretch out the development. I'm sure he'll be Mr. more Charleston. than happy to address that. Councilwoman Kinston, we plan to build the entire project, but it'll be a rolling kind of thing. You know, you'll start at one part of it, get that up and running, and continue to build it out over a period of about 18 months. Okay. The other, um, it's more of a comment, mm -hmm. is when we first looked at this, I was concerned, and then I started doing some research. Right. And one of the things is in looking at this specific um, aspect of doing this, it kind of really reminds me of a military housing, <laughs> the way it's set up. When you look at it, you know, you have your individual home, and then, like you said, it's your home, um, with the green space and everything around it, which is very comfortable for, you know, even our military when they're coming in and out. Right. So I do like the concept of it. I think it's a very um, innovative way to be able to solve some of our shortage in housing. So I'll say thank you. Right. Thank you. I lived in military housing on Fort Bragg that was set up just like that. Yes, sir, it was. Yeah. So did I. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Jones. I'll make this quick. Uh, this is a fairly new trend. I know we've been seeing it out in the western part of the state in uh, Morrisville, and more recently in the, in the Wilmington area. I'm just curious, have you had an opportunity to reach out to see what their text amendments, what some of their best practices and things were as it relates to how they handled that? We did, and that did go into what we put together. Okay. Um, there, we spoke to the city of Charlotte. They've got one that's that's fairly new in Wilmington as well. Outstanding. And if this is an affordable housing project, is that no? There's a connotation that goes with that word. Right, and that's that's what I, that's what I'm getting. That's what I'm getting at. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Because we're we're down twenty thousand. Units and I, I, I get the, the concept and I, I know it's a good idea, but I, I did want to address that part too as far as right. that's a huge deficit for this right. city. These are all market rate units, uh, just like any other apartment complex in town. Mm -hmm. All right, then, uh, Mr. Mr. I'm, I'm coming. Uh, uh, with that, we'll close the public hearing on this item, Council Member. Mr. Mayor, I had questions. And I thought you wanted to make the motion. No, I told you I had questions. All right, go ahead. Yeah, Can before. I still make the, my question? Yeah. Okay. So I did just very briefly. There is no way possible that someone could turn their unit into an Airbnb. Is that correct? In, in this setup, no, because these people are going to own every unit. It's right. just that like you couldn't turn your, apart your apartment room uh, unit I knew the answer. I just wanted the, the listening exactly. audience. I know. I, so I will say that I'm a part of a, a similar project in, in Georgia, and I'm excited to see this happening. Um, it came up at NLC um, and also um, with some other council members that I talked to across the state. And so with that, I'd like to make a motion to adopt, propose, adopt the proposed text amendments as written. 
Motion by Councilmember Ingram. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilmember Jones. Any discussion on the motion? All right, Council, I look to you for your votes. All those in favor? All right, Madam Clerk. Uh, those voting in favor, count. Okay. Uh, Ours don't work. Yeah, well, I forgot to sum it out. So we'll have to do it the old fashioned way, but we will have our technical issues worked out. Those voting in favor, Councilman Davis, Ingram, Amen. Dawkins. Okay. All right, those voting against, none listed. All right. And the, the, I have a quick question. Um, Madam Attorney, I think when this comes back to us, will it come back to us as a quasi-judicial? If it comes, is there another part to this or no? No, no ma'am, this okay. was a rezoning. So okay, it won't come back. thank you. All right, item 9.02, consideration for the renaming of Coalition Boulevard to Beaver Street. Ms. Baptiste. Um, hold on. Somebody left their phone up here. Good evening. Um, this is case number SN22-001. This is to rename a portion of Coalition Boulevard to Beaver Street. Um, with the construction of the new Amazon warehouse um, on Coalition Street, on um, Coalition Boulevard off of Bragg Boulevard, um, Coalition Boulevard will now become two dead-end streets. So we received a request from um, the county 911 addressing um, to rename a portion of the, the roadway so that it'll be easier for um, 911 addressing as well as 911 emergency services. This is in cu um, currently in District 3 and staff is recommending approval. As you can see from the subject property map, Coalition Boulevard is located here and here, but with the development of the facility in the middle of the lot, this roadway will no longer be able to be connected as a through lot, um, well, through a through roadway. So the request came from the county to rename this portion of the um, roadway in order to not have any confusion um, with, if emergency services are needed at the site. The applicant did request to rename this portion Beaver Drive in order to, um, as a throwback to their, where they grew up on um, in Texas, because they grew up on Beaver Road in Texas. Um, the request is to rename co that portion of Coalition Boulevard to Beaver Street. Um, the county has evaluated the petition and has not found any conflicts or duplications. And staff is recommending approval of this, um, this, uh, this road renaming. Are there any questions um, for staff after you have your public hearing? Yeah, well, we'll uh Get back to you, Ms. Baptiste, if any arise. So with that, we'll open the public hearing. Madam Clerk, please call your first speaker. And we have no speakers for this item. All right, with that, we'll close the public hearing on this item. Councilman Jones. I'd like to make a motion to approve the renaming of a portion of Coalition Boulevard to Beaver Street as requested by the applicant. There's a motion by Councilmember Jones, seconded by Councilmember Wright. Any discussion on the motion? Those in favor, show of hands. All right, Madam Clerk, this unanimous motion carries. Item 9.03, annexation request of 3404 Cumberland Road. Ms. Baptiste. Yes, sir. Um, this is an annexation request that was submitted by Kojo Sam Kwasi. Um, the request is to annex a parcel along Cumberland Road. Um, this item is related to P22-04, which was on the consent agenda. Um, the request is to go from Cumberland County zoning of CP to the city of Fayetteville's um, CC zoning district. 
The location is 3404 Cumberland Road, and the acreage is 0 .047 acres, and the request is in, would be in District 5. This um, annexation is non-contiguous. Um, it is the intended land use um, is to keep it as the existing commercial development. This um, parcel is currently developed with as a SAMS towing site. Um, the reason for the annexation is the applicant is seeking to get on the city's, uh, city of Fayetteville's record rotation. As you can see from the vicinity map, the parcel is located in green. Um, the property and the property here is the closest property that is located within the city of Fayetteville's boundary. Um, according to the GIS mapping system, um, the, this property is located approximately 90 feet away from um, the city of Fayetteville city limit lines. As you can see from the subject property map, um, picture, this property is currently developed as Sam's Towing. And again, Mr. Um, Sam is looking to be annexed into the city in order to get on the city of Fayetteville's record rotation. Um, this, um, this satellite annexation does meet all the standards required um, under general statute. The nearest point of, on proposed, the proposed satellite annexation is not more than three miles from the primary corporate limits. Um, the nearest point is 90 feet away. No point on the proposed satellite is closer to another um, corporate city limit. Um, the distance to Hope Mills is approximately 2.1 miles away, whereas the distance to the um, city of Fayetteville line is approximately 90 feet. The area is so situated that this um, city will be able to provide um, city services. Um, no subdivision will be fragmented by the proposed annexation. Um, this area consists of one parcel that is currently um, being used as commercial development. Um, the area within the satellite limits, um, when added to all other satellite areas, does not exceed 10%. Currently, satellite areas make up approximately 1.5%. With this satellite annexation, the percentage will go up to 1.6%. Um, here are the options for the request for tonight. Um, you can either adopt the annexation request um, effective tonight, March 28th, or um, make an effective date of July 28, 2022 make an effective date of July 28, 2023, um, not to adopt the satellite annexation or table the requested annexation. Staff is requesting that you um, hold any questions until after the public hearing. Um, that is staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baptiste. Uh, with that, we'll open the public hearing. Madam Clerk, please call your first speaker. Yes, sir. We have one speaker for this item, Mr. Kojo Sam Kuasi. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Mr. Kojo? Was that the gentleman that just left, Jennifer? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. No, we have no other speakers. All right. With that, we'll close the public hearing. Councilman Dawkins. Thank you. I thought most folks could hear me without the mic. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thank you. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the proposed ordinance annexing the area effective March 28, 2022, and establish the initial zoning consistent with the Zoning Commission recommendation. All right. There's a motion by Councilmember Dawkins, seconded by Councilmember Hare. Any discussion on the motion? All right, Council, I'll look to you for your votes. Those in favor? Uh, Madam Clerk, this is unanimous. But Motion carries item 9.04, uh, proposed installment financing for a new fire station. Mr. Tolan, the money man. Hey, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Council. 
It's like I feel like I'm presenting and I'm standing in your way of lunch. <laughs> or bed. One or two. <laughs> okay. What we have tonight is we have a proposed installment financing for Fire Station 4 off Bragg Boulevard. Um, as you see before you, this is a this section of the general statute that requires the city of Fayetteville to have a, a public hearing for this type of financing due to it involves property and the length of time for the financing. And then so action after the public hearing is closed is to approve the preliminary resolution, which is attached to the CCAM, and then authorize staff to file an application with the local government commission. We'll bring this final resolution back after we get the bids back on um, May 23rd. Thank you, Mr. Tolan. And tonight, Council, just as a reminder, is just a public hearing. So um, uh, we'll come back uh, as stated. Councilman Harry, you had a? Oh, no, sir. Uh, no, sir, Mayor. Uh, All right. Uh, so we'll open, uh, we'll open the public hearing. Madam Clerk, please call your first speaker. No, we have no speakers for this item. All right. And with that, we will close the public hearing. Uh, so, uh, no action needed, sir? It's just, just for the public hearing? Approve the preliminary resolution and authorize staff to file the application with the LGC. I'll make that. All right. Uh, council. Uh, I saw Councilman Dawkins, and then I saw Councilman, uh, heard Councilman Wright. So I, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, since I did uh, grow up not far from station number four and also station number two, uh, I'm thrilled uh, to make the motion to approve the preliminary resolution attached to the CCAM and authorize staff to file an application with the local government commission. And in 1968, I rode my bicycle by there to go to the Dunkin' Donuts. I was just about to ask you, did they have fire stations when you grew up? <laughs> <laughs> they were they were horse-drawn water carriages. Well, well Mr. Right. Mayor, in so, that case, since it was in 1968, I would love to second that. All sure. right. Well, y'all are both preceding some of us on here. But uh, the motion by Councilmember Dawkins uh, and seconded by Councilmember Wright. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All right. Those in favor? Show of hands. All right. Mr. Harry, you with? Okay. All right, Madam Clerk, that's unanimous. Motion to adjourn. Mr. Mayor. Uh, All right. Mr. Mayor. Yes.